Ready on our end, Mr. Chair. All right. I will now call to order the Charter, uh, the Charter Commission special meeting of Thursday, June 11th, 2020. First item on the agenda. Uh, we'll actually, we'll do a roll call of the commissioners um, present for this meeting. Uh, Denise, could you do the roll call, please? Thank you. Rod Axtell. Here, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Jack Beloga. Present. Ronald Barnes. Ronald Barnes, can you hear uh, me? There you are. I was thank reading. You. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy to do. Um, Jim Goodermont. He is muted as well. Yes. Jim, can you unmute yourself? I see he's here. Jim, I've unmuted you. Go ahead. All right, um, Kathy Gustafson. Cynthia Hunt. Lindell. Nelson. Present. Grant Peterson. Steve Peterson. Here. John Stanley. Here. Jay Taylor. Mark Thorson. Here. Carrie Weatherby. Present. And Roger Willett. So it looks like we have Jim Goodermont, Kathy Gustafson, Ronna Lindell, Jay Taylor, and Roger Willett absent. Okay. And two of those may be joining us. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Denise, Jim Goodermont is here. I can see him. Yeah, he's just muted. Oh, yep, there he is. I'm sorry. Sorry, Jim. <laughs> I've unmuted you. Can you have an audio and a visual? We do. Yes. Okay, thank you. Correction. Jim yeah. is in the house. Is everybody else hearing some background noise periodically, some chatter, or is it just me? No, it's good if people could turn themselves on mute while they're not talking. I agree. All right. Um, We're going to move on to organizational business item 2.1 consider an ordinance 2020-17 requesting voter approval to amend the charter related to rank choice voting do we have a staff report please uh chair and commissioners uh we have a powerpoint presentation for you uh, ms wilson the assistant city manager and myself will be presenting the slides and uh, City Clerk Janet uh, Lewis is also available for questions. Uh, the slide presentation uh, does include uh, two very short one and a half minute videos. Um, so uh, don't be alarmed if those start playing. There are about 10 slides and um, we have the opportunity for some uh, discussion on the back side of that. And then we would open the public hearing after the discussion uh, internally. After we close the public hearing, then there will be um, discussion again. Um, so with that, I'll start with uh, the first slide. Um, just the date here, we're here tonight to talk about this. A reminder of our timeline of where we are in this process. Um, if you'll recall, uh, earlier this year, the city council directed staff to prepare an ordinance. Uh, and that ordinance was the kind that asked the voters um, to vote as to whether they wanted to amend the city charter to allow for ranked choice voting, which is abbreviated here as RCV. Uh, on May 7th, the, this charter commission received an update, uh, but no action was required at that time. And on May 18th, the city council had held a public hearing and acted on ordinance 2020-17, which included the charter amendments that would be required in order to transition to ranked choice voting and bring the question to the voters in November. That ordinance was sent to the Charter Commission uh, and that is the reason that we are here tonight on June 11th. We're holding a public hearing on that ordinance and 
and you will have the opportunity to either take action or not take action tonight. Um, in the event that action, uh, that ordinance is ultimately approved in some form um, by the bodies, uh, in order to get on the ballot, the city council would need to set ballot language um, no later than August, uh, because that's when it is due to the county. And then the ballots are prepared, ballot education would occur, and the election would be in early November. Next slide. With regard to what's being um, asked of you tonight, it's somewhat similar to that second question of uh, organized collection that we talked about a few weeks ago. Um, here again, um, this uh, ordinance is asking uh, the voters to weigh in on this. Uh, as you recall, the city charter can be amended in a variety of different ways. Um, the city council directed staff to prepare this ordinance in this particular way to bring it to the voters. Uh, so the charter commission's uh, order and role in this process is to choose whether or decide whether the ordinance that the city council has sent to you is acceptable or not. Is it, is the process, are the amendments to the charter, um, if approved by the voters, acceptable to the charter commission? Um, the charter commission has 60 days by state law to consider this particular uh, set of charter amendments in this ordinance. Uh, and the state law allows you to extend that period an additional, additional period of time. If you find the uh, ordinance uh, before you tonight acceptable, you can act on the resolution to approve it. Um, if you don't find it acceptable, you can reject it. Um, and you can also offer substitute language. Uh, so there are a variety of uh, options for the Charter Commission um, this evening. And um, again, just a reminder that the City Council started this process and by starting it they made the choice that they wanted to put this question to the voters. They could have taken other routes. Um, as you know, we've, uh, we've amended the charter in other ways in the past. The council decided to pick this particular approach. So what you're being asked tonight is, is this particular approach that the city council has um, prepared for your consideration um, something that is acceptable to you? Are these amendments to the, to the charter uh, ac acceptable to you? Should they be uh, approved by the voters? Um, at a later date. So with that, next slide. All righty. Turn it over to Chris. Thank you, Melissa. Um, can folks hear me? Yes? Yep. Okay, great. My name is Chris Wilson. I'm the Assistant City Manager, and I'm going to walk through a brief introduction of what ranked choice voting is and then ask the commission to conduct a public hearing and take comment from the public um, with their thoughts and opinions on the matter. So ranked choice voting is sometimes called instant runoff voting or preferential voting. Um, the three terms generally all mean the same thing. Um, at their core, it's a process that allows voters to rank their choice for each office. So instead of voting for just a single candidate, uh, voters mark their ballot to indicate this is my first choice candidate, my second choice candidate, my third choice candidate, and so on. In Minnesota, ranked choice voting can be used for municipal elections only, so that to elect the mayor and city council. It cannot be used for school board or county or state or federal offices. Um, one feature of ranked choice voting is that it eliminates the need for a primary election. Currently, our city charter calls for a primary election to narrow the filed candidates to just two to appear on the general election ballot in November. Uh, with a ranked choice voting, each candidate that files proceeds onward to the general election and there is no primary. In the state of Minnesota, ranked choice voting has been considered in a number of jurisdictions. To the best of our knowledge, it is currently used in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and St. Louis Park. Um, the, as Melissa covered, um, the charter amendment would be needed as the first step. And if the charter is amended to adopt ranked choice voting, then there would be some follow-up action by the city council to amend city code and adopt some additional administrative procedures that get down into the fine detail of how elections would be operated under ranked choice voting. So we have two, uh, as Melissa said, very short videos that are intended to provide um, 
an overview of how ranked choice voting works. So I'm going to launch the first one here. I'm not hearing any sound. There's no audio, Chris. Okay. Um, you can go to this to this option, the the live link to Chris. Yep. Whoops. Just bear with me for a moment here, please. I'm going to. possible to try and turn it up with the volume there and see if that is works. that working are I'm you not hearing it i'm not hmm. is it possible to turn it up there unmute it chris this button here is there any audio now no okay um on the on the share content page, there's a tick box that controls whether the audio is shared or not. Wonderful, thank you. Steve. Give me just a moment here. I apologize, folks, for the technical difficulties. So, Steve, uh, so share multimedia, maybe? Steve, are you there? I'm looking at the WebEx site, and on the share content page, there's a tick box that says share your computer audio. When you, once, once you click that, like the, the screen with the arrow in it, that page that pops up there, there's a check box on that thing. At least that's what the documentation shows. I can't see it because I you don't have sharing of it and uh, kind of enabled for me to verify that that's how it works. I apologize. Let's try this. Do people see a video on YouTube that says ranked choice voting? I, I see it. Okay. All right, so we're going to try again. Are you hearing that? No. Okay. Because there's almost instant audio that goes along with it. So. Oh, Chris, I wonder if those drop downs would those any of those drop downs work on the top here under the screen sharing option? On the bar at the very top of your browser where it shows when you're sharing your screen, you can yep. select. So anything. I have pause, share, assign, mute me video. Is that what you're looking at? Yep. The other option here is you can share the URL and we can all go off and watch it and then come back. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a while to get everybody on the system. We don't really want to let you go and exactly. And have to come back. So I sent you a link to that page that I was looking at, Chris. Thank you so much. I take a peek at email. It's about Yep, I got your email and I found the link. Yeah, about a third of the way down on the page, you'll see a screenshot of what I'm looking at. Oh, it's on the very bottom, this button here.
Melissa, can you tell me more about what you're seeing? You know, those little bubbles at the very bottom, there's yes. the, there's the audio and then there's the video and then there's that box with the arrow coming up. Oh, share content. Yeah. Yeah. Let's That's try that. Still no audio. I wonder if we could, so I have it pulled up on my cell phone. This is really a wonky way to do things, but I could hold up my phone and see if that works. Give it a shot. So I'm going to go right back to the very beginning, Denise. Here I have ready? One, two, three. Oh, whoops. In most elections, you only vote for one candidate for each office. But in some elections, voters can rank three or more candidates for each office. It's called rank choice voting. Here's an example of how it works. All of the candidates will be listed on the ballot in three columns. Make your first choice vote in column one by filling in the oval of the candidate you'd most like to win. Vote for your second choice in column two and make your third choice in column three. That's all there is to it. Now let's see how the votes are counted. Let's say there are four candidates running for mayor, Asha, Zach, Omar, and Lucy. Once the polls close, we count all the first choice votes first. To be elected mayor, a candidate needs more than half the votes. In this example, Asha has more than half of the votes, so she's declared the winner. However, if no candidate gets more than half the votes, we start eliminating candidates and counting the next choices of those who voted. In this example, Zach is the candidate with the smallest number of first choice votes, so he is cut. We use the second choice votes on Zach's ballots and count those voters' second choices instead. If one of the remaining candidates now has more than half of the total votes, that candidate is declared the winner. If not, the next lowest candidate, Lucy, is eliminated. Her votes are now counted for the next choice on the ballot. Some of Lucy's votes went to Zach, who was already eliminated, so those new votes for Zach instead count for those voters' third choice candidate. We are now down to two candidates, and Omar clearly has more than half of the votes. That makes him the winner. That's how ranked choice voting works. For more information on ranked choice voting, visit our website. And Chris, I have the audio pulled up for the next one if you'd like to. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Are you going to get the ad too, Melissa? Um, I don't have an ad. Um, share, share your screen, the video yep. of in the point, and then I'll get the video going. All righty. Can folks see a screen that says NPR News on it? Yes. Excellent. Are you ready? I am. Here we go. Color. The ranked choice voting way. Instead of voting for just one color, you get to rank your top three. Well, purple is the best, but if I can't have purple, I want blue. And if neither of those wins, I guess I can live with orange. Now, let's count up everybody's votes. Under ranked choice voting rules, it's not enough just to get the most votes. You need a majority. More than 50% of the votes. Purple's ahead, but it has only seven votes. It needs at least 11 to win. So we eliminate the color in last place. Sorry, orange fans. We're going to your second choice. Two more for green. One for purple. 
but no color has 11 votes yet. Still no majority. Bye bye, blue. One more for purple. Four for green. And we have a winner. The ranked choice voting way. Alrighty, so thank you for bearing with us there during those technical difficulties. <coughs> There's a first time for everything, and unfortunately, that was our first time trying to share a video over WebEx. So we're we're all learning throughout this process. <laughs> we are going to go back to the PowerPoint. Hopefully, folks can see that now. I see it. Um, the the ordinance that the city council passed and has sent to the commission for your consideration has four sections. The first section of the ordinance would eliminate the provision of the city charter that calls for a primary election for municipal offices. Because as noted before, you don't need a primary if you vote with ranked choice voting. The sec Second section of the ordinance adjusts the time period that candidates must file for office to be a set number of days before the general election rather than a certain number of days before the primary election. And that number of days is set in state law. Um, section three is the section that actually says the city of Bloomington will use ranked choice voting as its means of selecting candidates for municipal office. And it directs the city council to adopt further rules and regulations for the administration of ranked choice voting. And then section four states that this ordinance shall take effect 30 days after the November 2020 general election, only if 51% of the votes cast are in favor of the charter amendment. So that's what the charter would be amended to say. Um, and uh, Melissa's going to talk about what the ballot question would actually be like. All right. So as you can see on your screen now, um, we thought it would be helpful for you to have a sense of what these draft ballot questions might look like. There's no, um, uh, these aren't the exact questions and obviously there's three of them here and there would only be one on the ballot, but we just wanted to give you a sense of what the questions could be like. Um, and so I, we prepared three uh, possibilities that might be moving forward. Um, and once we get done with uh, today or at the end of this process, um, be interested in your feedback on that. Um, probably not tonight, but um, as we move forward. Um, so the first one I'll read aloud for those listening in on the call. That is, shall Bloomington voters elect its mayor and city council members by the ranked choice voting method? That would be one possible ballot question. Another possible question could be, shall the Bloomington City Charter be amended to elect the mayor and city council members by the ranked choice voting method? And then a third idea we had, uh, again, would only be one question on the ballot, uh, is shall the city elect its mayor and city council members using the ranked choice voting method? Uh, so um, with that, uh, I just want to remind you that we have a public hearing tonight um, for those people on uh, um, on the next screen here, we've got the information on how to participate in that public hearing. Chris, can you share the uh, slide again for the PowerPoint? Yes. <coughs> so you see the information here for folks that are uh, watching the WebEx. Here are the different ways you can participate. Uh, Voicemails that were that prior to the meeting were forwarded to the commission members prior to tonight, around 2.30 today, and so they have received those in advance. Um, for those people that would like to participate live, we have a call-in number and a conference ID. There's an operator who is um, managing and administering that part of the process. Um, callers will be placed on hold until it's their turn. And as a reminder for those listening uh, online and uh, on te telephone, uh, public hearing testimony is listed, li limited to three minutes per caller. That's in the um, Charter Commission's rules. Um, we ask you to identify yourself for the record when you begin the testimony. That's helpful to the recording secretary. And it's also helpful to indicate uh, if you're a Bloomington resident. 
Uh, the last thing I'll just mention before um, we stand for any questions before we begin the public hearing. <clears throat> next, uh, next slide is that we will be going um, after the public hearing. We'll be having some additional discussion and then again, we'll be talking about those options. With that, do you have any questions for Janet, Chris or me about what was in the PowerPoint presentation or um, any other uh, preliminary questions before we public hearing. And um, commissioners, if you have any questions, I would just, um, the way I'm seeing this uh, is that regardless of how we might individually feel about ranked choice voting, um, what we're really being asked to look at here tonight is uh, whether or not to act on the city council's recommendation that uh, the charter or that this be voted on by the citizens. So it, I, I think it's important to note that voting yes or no doesn't necessarily indicate your uh, uh, opinion on, on ranked choice voting. What we are being asked to act on is uh, sending this uh, at the request of the city council, this item uh, to the voters in the fall. Uh, with that, uh, Commissioner Beloga. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, is is it, uh, I don't know, but I have a sense by the number of emails that we received uh, that this may be an item where we have a lot of public comment. And I personally would advocate that we have um, a screening where we listen to city residents first in the interest of time and uh, then move on to non-residents. Is that, uh, I'd like feedback from the rest of the commission on that uh, proposal. Uh, Commissioner Beloga, I, I think that makes sense um, uh, to make sure that I know some people have to go to work tomorrow or otherwise may not be able to hang on. I think it makes sense to allow residents uh, to speak first. Question for Chris though, is how would we manage that using our moderator here? Um, Mr. Chair, we can ask our operator Maria this evening to simply ask if there are any Bloomington residents that wish to speak and she would patch those through. And then when she tells us there's no more Bloomington residents, um, she would ask if there are any non-residents on the line wishing to speak. We are at the mercy of the um, honest answers from those individuals. However, I cannot see the list of callers, nor can I tell their residency, or nor can Maria tell their residency. Maria is our moderator, correct? Operator on our call-in phone service, yes. Okay, all right. Uh, it, would any other commissioners like to weigh in on this suggestion by uh, Commissioner Beloga? Anybody opposed to the concept? Uh, we can let the moderator know to handle it in that manner if there are no if there's no one opposed. Mark, I think it's a good idea. All right, Chris. Uh, anyone else like to weigh in? Okay, let's let's uh, handle it that way. We can pass that along to the moderator. Yeah. Are you ready to begin the public hearing? Um, I'd just like to just find out one more time if any commissioners have any questions presentation we just heard or any specifics about what we are being asked to act on tonight. And then are there any any questions at all of com from commissioners? All right, I will now uh, open up the public hearing for this item. Here. I saw I saw oh. member Barnes raise his hand. Uh, Commissioner Barnes, I'm sorry. Commissioner Barnes, you have to unmute yourself. How do, I, uh, how do I raise my hand? Is that the channel? You, you can either raise your hand, you know, <laughs> literally, f yeah. physically, or you can open up the, the chat and you can click, there's a little hand icon and you can raise your hand that way. I'm also trying to watch that chat so I can see if anybody, I may not see everyone, but. Um, okay, thank you. Is that is that your only question? Yes. Okay. All right. I have opened up the public hearing. One moment, Mr. Chair. Okay. 
Maria, this is Chris Wilson with the city staff. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you, Maria. Maria, would you please ask if there are any callers that are Bloomington residents that wish to address the commission and then begin patching them through one by one to speak? Okay, sure. And for anyone who would like to speak, please press star one on your telephone keypad. Again, that's star one on your telephone keypad. Chris and Chair Thorson. Sorry to interrupt. Um, we did have that list as well that I sent out at about 2.30 with the um, folks that had requested to speak. There are a number of Bloomington residents. There are about four, one, two, three, four, five on the list that were not verified as Bloomington residents, okay. um, but they had requested to speak as well. Denise, I'll have to get that pulled up. Maria, would you go ahead and patch us through with our first call? And then, Denise, I will get okay. to that next. First caller, sure. please. So the first person and your first person on, on the line is Mick Blanche. Your line is open. Good evening, charter members. My name is Nick Blanche and I'm a Bloomington resident. Uh, the ranked choice voting scheme that's being foisted on Bloomington residents by a few during a pandemic and riotous environment, I liken to nothing more than the current extreme defund the police movement. In addition to a city council who refuses to do its due diligence involving a change in municipal voting. I suppose we're expected to debate the disadvantages of RCV at a candidate forum, a Heritage Days event, event or a campaign appearance. Uh, that's not how city business decisions should be made for all residents in normal times. This city has totally abdicated its due diligence and vetting responsibilities by hiding all of the cons from Bloomington residents, the Charter Commission, and the City Council. Uh, presentations by St. Louis Park advocates do not complete the city's investigative responsibilities. Now the City Council is expecting the Charter Commission to bless a seriously flawed process. Many, communi many communities, including Duluth and our current city manager's previous employer, have looked at RCV and decided to pass on it because it wasn't needed. Still others who have gone through RCV have decided to go back to our traditional plurality voting system. There is nothing inherently wrong with our current system of voting here in Bloomington. And no matter how many times they write it, say it, or post it, RCV is not a solution to any problems that quite honestly do not exist here. For two years, Steve Elkins, Dean Phillips, the League of Women Voters, Fair Vote Minnesota, and the Democratic Party has, been, has tried to fundamentally throw mistruths and generalities to council members and other influential members of our community. RCV does not save money, it actually costs more. We cannot afford that right now with our budget shortfall. Anyone can run for office currently if they so choose. This is not a current barrier to any diverse candidate, therefore there is no advantage with RCV. Under our current system, every vote counts. Under RCV, not every vote counts. And many times votes are counted more than once after re-rankings, leading to ballot exhaustion and disenfranchisement, no matter how you look at it. Under RCV, there are greater chances that an ineffective leader will eventually win a given election. Take Jacob Fry, for example. He's a fifth rounder who we just recently saw let his own police precinct burn. He didn't even get half the total vote. A St. Cloud study found that almost 60% of Minneapolis voters found RCV very confusing. There is no guarantee there will be a larger voter turnout with either system either. Uh, voters, voter turnout, voters who turn out or do not turn out do so for a lot of reasons. For these reasons, I ask you to reject the recommended charter change referendum the council has burdened all of you with. Trying to vote on this referendum with two other confusing questions on the garbage and possibly a referendum dealing with parks is just too much in this current environment of uncertainty. This needs more time, more vetting, and more public debate if there's going to be a serious effort. Thank you. Thank you. Maria, can you hear me? Yes. Maria, would you ask if there is a speaker by the name of Laura Calbone or Calboni on the line? Okay, so um, Laura Calboni, your line is now open. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Laura, please. Hello, can, can you hear me? Okay, 
All right. Um, thank you, Charter Commissioners. My name is Laura Calboni. I live in Bloomington, and I'm one of the organizers educating residents about ranked choice voting and the benefits of using it for our municipal elections. There are many reasons why I support ranked choice voting. It's more inclusive and representative. It saves time and money, and it encourages positive issues-based campaigns. Tonight, I'd like to talk about the timing of putting RCV on the ballot this year. First of all, this is a presidential election year in which voter turnout is expected to be extremely high. Putting RCV on the ballot this year will ensure that the most voters can weigh in on it. Second, the City Council has been talking to residents about RCV for almost two years. The Charter Commission started studying it a year ago. <clears throat> RCV volunteers and I have already talked to many, many voters, the vast majority of whom like RCV and like uh, the benefits that it can bring to our city. <clears throat> Third, in these times of COVID, we need to make our elections safer, more accessible for voters, and more efficient and cost effective. RCV would eliminate the need for the primary, thereby reducing the risk during a potential future outbreak, as well as save the city the cost of administering primaries. RCV also works well with mail-in ballots and is in fact used in several Southern states on mail-in ballots for overseas and military voters. Fourth, democracy can't and shouldn't wait, even during a pandemic. We must be constantly looking for ways to improve our democracy. Bloomington voters want an opportunity to make our elections better. They're ready for this conversation and they are ready to vote yes. And finally, right now, there is momentum to make our government more representative and responsive to all citizens' needs, including historically underrepresented communities of color. Ranked choice voting has been shown to foster inclusivity and diversity. City Cities that have adopted RCV have seen an increase in women and people of color both running and winning. So why is that? Well, under our current system, most city council and mayor candidates are eliminated by 5 to 10 percent of Bloomington voters in a summer primary before they have even had a chance to be heard by most voters. This system favors candidates with name recognition and large financial backing. Under RCV, new diverse voices are able to run and be heard all the way through to November. Then in November, more voters and a more representative segment of our community have a chance to weigh in on all the candidates. That's how RCV expands representation for underrepresented communities. Bloomington is on the cusp of leading the way toward a better democracy that's more inclusive and representative and that responds better to the needs of the people. Let's do it. Let's show that Bloomington listens to its residents and is working toward a brighter future for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maria, for our next caller, would you uh, see if there is a Danielle Garbina on the line, please? Okay, one moment, please. And for uh, Danielle Garbina, please press star one on your telephone keypad so that I can open up your line. Okay, and Danielle Garbina, your line is open. Yes, hi, my name is Danielle Garbina, and I'm a Bloomington resident. <clears throat> I ask that the Charter Commission to not put ranked choice voting on the November ballot. I spoke at the City Council meeting requesting the same. Unfortunately, it was late, and because of the pandemic, I had to work and educate the kids in the morning. There was too much on the agenda, and instead of postponing the hearing on the non-essential request for RCV, the council chose to move the hearing for the non-essential business of RCV before essential business. The hearing was rushed, calls were dropped, and not all residents participated that wanted to. Again, the hearing was rushed and there were essential items on the agenda, some that ended up being postponed. Ranked choice voting should not be on the November 2020 ballot because many residents have not heard about RCV and those who have had not had time, have not had time to understand RCV or their concerns with RCV. Even the city and council does not have complete information. The data that was provided questioned whether the hand count process would be eliminated. This should have been known before the council voted. Whether there is hand count process or not would determine the cost of RCV, another concern that should be known. Although much of the stay at home order has been lifted, it will still be difficult for residents to participate in the process. Not all residents will appreciate people coming to their door. Those who want RCV are organized and have been for some time, while those who are just learning about RCV have not, and more time is needed to address the concerns with RCV. 
Another concern is the appearance that the city is promoting and marketing ranked choice voting because the Bloomington fire truck is included promotional material for RCV. I ask the Charter Commission to not approve putting RCV on the ballot this November. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Maria, would you see if um, uh, Marsha Watson is on the line, ready to give testimony? Okay, for Marsha Watson, your, your line is now open. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Marsha Watson, and I've lived in Bloomington for 10 years, and I'm now retired. Throughout my career, I promoted reading for pleasure and lifelong learning as a corporate merchandise manager for B. Dalton booksellers for over a decade, and for 25 years as a senior librarian with Hennepin County Library. Researching and sharing valuable, reliable information with people is still my calling. As a ranked choice voting volunteer, I've met with hundreds of voters throughout Bloomington to share the advantages of ranked choice voting. RCV is a better process for running fair and representative elections. As you know, we have very low participation in our local city elections. I want more people voting and deciding how to make our city the best it can be. I want all residents to matter and know their ideas are valued. I want to make it easier for all members of our community to participate and have their voices heard in our local elections, especially those communities most impacted by racism, disparities, and injustice. I want the winner of an election to represent the majority of voters. That's what ranked choice voting does. In an RCV election, the winner has more than 50% of the vote, a majority. RCV is more cost effective and convenient for everyone. With only one election, it significantly increases voter participation. The results and the evidence are clear about the benefits of adopting ranked choice voting. It's all on the RCV Bloomington website at rcvbloomington.org. Please examine all the evidence, put ranked choice voting on the ballot this November, and let the voters decide. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mar Thank you, Marcia. Uh, Maria, would you please see if Sally Ness is one of your callers and patch her through to provide testimony? Okay, Sally Ness, your line is now open. You may now speak. Okay, thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, Sally, we can hear you. Thank you. Tonight I am asking the Charter Commission to not put ranked choice voting on the ballot this November. I ask this due to the city being under a state of emergency where residents were told only essential business was to be conducted. Changing the city charter concerning how residents vote is not essential business, and therefore the council should not have voted to request it be heard by the Charter Commission. The council should not have voted, but it did. And yet, as someone pointed out on social media, it is not mentioned in the Bloomington briefing. The council voted on a change in the way residents vote and yet did not take the opportunity to inform all residents of the possible change by including it in the Bloomington briefing and ask for resident input. That should not happen. Additionally, I asked the Charter Commission not to consider ranked choice voting, putting ranked choice voting on the ballot because the city did not include all the data with the notice of the hearing. The council voted and residents were not provided all that the council considered when voting. The city also did not include all the data with the charter commission meeting notice either, which would mean residents wanting to address their concerns would be without needed information. Also, remote, remote participation is not working. Residents have called during the city council meetings and their calls have been dropped. When residents are speaking, it is unknown whether council are listening because the camera is not on council members. One council member left to use the bathroom, which is allowed, but it should be known by the public that, that, that this is not happening when a resident is speaking. Another concern is a resident who wanted to request the council revisit the vote was incorrectly told by a council member that it was too late when it was not. Again, the city is operating under a state of emergency and also a new agenda management system, and it is understandable errors will happen. What is not understandable is the council voting to change how residents vote during this time. Council member Bloga is on record stating, now is not the time to be looking at something like this, ranked choice voting. 
Council Member Carter is on record stating she will be patient concerning COVID-19. I ask the city charter to recognize it is not the time and to be patient. Thank you. Thank you. Maria, would you please patch through caller Lynn Lunderberg? Okay, for Lynn Lunderberg, your line is now open. You may now speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Lynn. Thank you, and good evening, commissioners. I'm a longtime Bloomington resident, um, and following the city council meeting last month, there, there was a flood of misinformation about RCV on Bloomington Community Facebook group. It was said that those of us who testified in favor of RCV were part of an outside group and that we all read off a script. I am simply a Bloomington resident concerned enough about the civility of elections to speak up in favor of RCV, which promotes campaigning that's more respectful, issue-based, and inclusive. I'm in favor of a system where candidates must focus on their own strengths and ideas instead of tearing down their opponents in favor of RCV, since candidates are compelled to step outside their base and talk to voters they might have ignored under the old system. I'm in favor of a system which fosters coalition building and a more meaningful political conversation, in favor of a system that yields leadership that's more reflective of the whole electorate. I found the FAQ section of the rcvbloomington.org website extremely helpful in distinguishing between fact and fiction. It dispels myths like RCV favors one party over another, RCV will cost more, or RCV allows some voters to vote more than once. In fact, we heard two of those myths, myths just mentioned today by our first caller. In addition to dispelling misinformation spread, being spread by opponents of RCV, the FAQs on the rcvbloomington.org site also provides information on who opposes RCV. The main opposition group in Minnesota is MN Voters Alliance. This is the same group that led the unsuccessful pro-voter ID push in Minnesota in 2011, and the same group which recently lost its case before the Minnesota Supreme Court to require public disclosure of voter information. In 2009, they challenged RCV with a lawsuit and lost. Now, I'm not employed by any political organization, or anyone for that matter, and I'm not reading off of a script. I'm just one citizen who hopes that the civility of this country, this state, and this city will improve. RCV supports more civil ca campaigns, and I hope to see it on the ballot in November. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maria, would you please patch through caller Gary Heyer or Heyer, H-E-Y-E-R? Okay, Gary Heyer, your line is now open. You may now speak. Good evening, uh, Charter Commissioners. Uh, my name is Gary Heyer. I'm a Bloomington resident and a candidate this November for a Minnesota House seat, um, Bloomington 50B. I successfully ran a grassroots movement uh, via the caucus system to assemble elect advanced delegates to national representation of a major political party candidate. I can tell you for a fact as an organizer and a strategist that ranked choice voting will force candidates to create teams of individual candidates masked in the name of diversity to get out the vote for a particular candidate who organizationally has already been chosen to be the winning candidate. So any candidate not colluding with other candidates will be guaranteed to lose. And I can tell you that from experience from, from running slate. Uh, running for city council will become a magnet for money to buy influence and power through a thoroughly rigged system of conspiracy coordinating slate and making deals to get out the vote regarding demographics who may otherwise not have voted. Uh, for example, now this is just a hypothetical of what could happen if ranked choice voting is passed. Let's say someone on the current city council is up for re-election. The, the city council uh, uh, publicly encourages diverse candidates to run and privately candidates are recruited to run uh, who will promote a slate, which is a ranked list of candidates. Uh, so with that particular uh, incumbent 
uh, as their number two choice, thereby getting out the vote of a particular cohort where the first choice candidate had zero realistic chance of garnering 50% of the vote, but motivated unwitting voters that are in the name of diversity uh, to vote a slate and choose that incumbent as their number two on their slate. When the first uh, choice candidate is eliminated, all of the voters who turned out for that candidate actually turned out for someone who was colluding with the incumbent campaign from the beginning to win the city council seat uh, for themselves. Uh, ranked choice voting will prevent single candidates who are passionate about change and transformative governance from running and will encourage a seemingly diverse team of colluding candidates to conspire and control government via money and power rather than from an open field of freedom, liberty, and inspired ideas. Thank you so much for uh, uh, your time and attention this evening. Please, please, please vote to reject the proposed amendment to the city charter as set forth in ordinance 2020-17 adopted by the City Council on May 18, 2020, and direct the City uh, Attorney to promptly notify the City Council of that action it's taken. Time, Thank Chair. you. Thank you. Thank you. Maria, would you please patch through Pat Meyer as our next caller? Okay, one moment, please. Okay, for Patrick Meyer, your line is now open. Well, thank you. My name is Pat. And I'm a Bloomington resident, and I want to thank every one of you that's on the Charter Commission. I know you're all giving your time to, to make sure that uh, Bloomington has better governance. So I, I, I know that's a job that you take seriously, so thank you. Um, RCV is a legitimate constitutional approach to a voting system for city council and mayor. Um, it can't be dismissed as folly or having no practical value. It's been in public discussion for a couple of years now. I'm I know that all of you take your job seriously, so I'm sure you're well versed on the issue. And a lot of what you're hearing tonight is probably, you may have heard some of it before. But the issue before you tonight is before you tonight because at the request of the city council, they of course were influenced by, this, by the citizens of Bloomington. And you know they brought this to the charter commission. You as charter commission are not deciding an RCV. You're deciding whether or not the question will be presented to the citizens of Bloomington. We have a lot of smart people in Bloomington. I think the questions that were presented earlier were pretty simple. The Bloomington voters will be the ones that will decide the fate of RCD in the end. There's three outcomes tonight. You you support the council, you or you, you don't want the citizens to choose, or you can postpone, which is kind of the same as not allowing the citizens to, cho to choose. Um, my advice to you, please trust the voters. I, I really want you to want to encourage you to allow the citizens of Bloomington to vote on RCV because you know democracy is based on this whole self-governance principle. Thank you. Thank you. Maria, would you please connect Andrew Sewell as our next speaker? Okay, for Andrew Gould, your line is now open. You may now speak. Hello? Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Uh, my name is uh, Andrew Thule. I'm a 48-year resident of Bloomington, and now it's not the time to pursue uh, ranked choice voting. Uh, the city is expected to have a 7 to $17 million shortfall um, in budget. Uh, this is not the time to explore a new voting process that will cost more. Um, if our current system is not broke, uh, let's not fix it. I sent all the commissioners an article and I want to highlight some of the findings of it. Um, neither monetary savings nor additional expenses can be directly attributed to the use of ranked choice voting at the municipal level. Bloomington claims by eliminating primaries that they're going to actually save $125,000. Um, one interesting fact was that cities that utilized ranked choice voting spent more on elections um, than cities that did not. Um, <clears throat> nowhere during the COVID-19 crisis has ranked choice voting um, been, been mentioned. In recent lookings at the, the Bloomington briefing, uh, nor the Sun Current, there's absolutely no mention 
of ranked choice voting whatsoever, and that's pretty telling to the city. Um, this is far from our, our seventh pillar of transparency and engagement in our, our government. Um, in 2020, Minneapolis needed um, $1,700,000 for the new ranked choice voting method, uh, costing the city five times more than traditional voting methods. And this ended up costing the city an additional $385,000. Commissioners, at this time, I urge you to say no to uh, changing the charter to adopt ranked choice uh, voting. As, as economic uncertainty is, it now is not the time um, to be adding more taxes to the residents of Bloomington. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Maria, would you please patch through Adam Rusinek as our next caller? And for Adam Rusinek, your line is now open. You may now speak. Okay. Uh, hi. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Adam Rusnak. Um, I'm a recent resident of Bloomington. Um, I've been here the past couple of years and I really like it and I appreciate the work everyone does and, and for having me. Um, I'm speaking in favor of having ranked choice voting on the ballot. Um, I, I'm personally for it. I, I understand there are people out there who who aren't, and, and I think that's totally fair, but I think it's definitely fair for Bloomington residents to vote and decide if that's something they, they want to use. Um, I think there's a lot of helpful information out there. I think, you know, a lot of Amer I'm not trying to conflate national elections with local stuff, but I think the U.S. has a long, rich history of trying to figure out what are the best ways to help citizens vote and, and determine elections. Um, and yeah, I, I just, I just beyond any sort of personal support for ranked choice voting, I just think it's important for Bloomington residents to decide for themselves um, if ranked choice voting is something we want to, to utilize. Um, I know it's, there's COVID stuff, there's a lot of weird things going on, but I feel like you can always find some reason to, to push something off. Um, if it's a good idea, I think cream rises, and I think voters are smart enough to decide for themselves if ranked choice voting is something they want to pursue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maria, for our next caller, could you patch through Gretchen Ronka? Okay, and for Gretchen Ronka, your line is now open. You may now speak. Yes, Commissioners, my name is Gretchen Ronka. My husband and I have lived at 5201 West 108th Street in Bloomington and Orange Thompson Rambler for 47 years. I attended last fall's Charter Commission study session that focused on this topic. I was impressed by the presentation that evening by the City of St. Louis Park staff. I thought they thoroughly detailed the intensive process the city had gone through that led to the decision to implement RCV in St. Louis Park this fall's election. That evening, you commissioners asked good and in-depth thoughtful questions, and I think you got pretty thorough responses from the presenters. This was one of many public opportunities for all of us in Bloomington to hear the pros and cons of ranked choice voting. There have been articles, I believe contrary to a couple of previous speakers, in mainstream media on this topic, Facebook website information as the topic relates specifically to Bloomington is easily accessible and has been for months. Time for this discussion is over. Please vote to include ranked choice voting on the ballot this number. We the voters can decide. Thank you. Thank you. Maria, could you please patch through Barb Speedling? I'm sorry, what's uh, the name again? Barb? Barb? Speedling, S P E E D L I N G. Okay. And for uh, Barb Speedling, please press star one on your telephone keypad so that I can open up your line. Okay. And uh, Barbara Speedling, your, your line is now open. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you, commissioners, for considering this important topic. I am a Bloomington resident and I support putting ranked choice voting on the ballot. Um, I moved to Bloomington uh, five years ago from Minneapolis and I love many things about Bloomington, but I miss using ranked choice voting on citywide elections. I see several advantages to ranked choice voting and I won't, I'll, I won't repeat uh, a few that have already been mentioned. 
Um, one of the things I appreciate most is it allows us to vote for who we think is the best candidate without feeling like we may be wasting a vote or indirectly helping a candidate we don't support by voting for a lesser known candidate. Um, it my, because it cuts out an election and not needing a primary, um, it can save money. And I, um, I've been an election judge and I know a lot of election judges are older, not all, but because they have more time. And many people with COVID-19 and that uh, hopefully in a couple of years when if, if this was passed, it wouldn't be an issue, but from what everything everybody's talking about, we're probably going to be needing to be careful for a long time. And at the same time, I think it's very timely because if it is passed, it reduces the risk that voters will spread or contract, you know, coronavirus or other illnesses at the polls by uh, reducing times that they have to go. Um, it provides candidates more time to talk with voters and voters more time to learn about candidates. Um, and it, I, my experience as an election judge uh, in Minneapolis is that it is pretty easy for voters to use. The vast majority of voters easily understand the concept of ranking their top candidates, and they appreciate the ability to still have their vote count if their first choice candidate doesn't win. Um, for those who just want to vote for one candidate, as they always have, ranked choice voting still allows them to do so. Um, I hope Bloomington will join with other pioneers, which includes at least 17 cities, three states, um, and several other states who use um, RCV for military and overseas voting in nine countries who are currently using ranked choice voting to provide a safer, cheaper, more representative, inclusive, and effective alternative to our current process. I urge you to allow voters the chance to adopt ranked choice voting for city elections. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Maria, if you could patch through caller Natalie Morose, please. Okay, and for Natalie, please press star one on your telephone keypad so that I can open up your line. Again, uh, for Natalie, press star one on your telephone. I guess she is not on the call right now, Chris. Okay, Margaret Swanson is the next name. Okay, and uh, for Margaret Swanson, your line is now open. Thank you. I'm Margaret Swanson. I live at 8848 Nicollet Avenue. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you tonight. And I do look forward to seeing ranked choice voting on the November ballot. There are several reasons to embrace ranked choice voting. I ascribe to all of them. However, COVID-19 and George Floyd have changed everything. In 2016, 100 million Americans did not vote in the presidential election. Now it's imperative that those Americans vote. I believe ranked choice voting can help address voter apathy. Ranked choice voting allows a broader array of candidates to enter into an election. An expensive, low turnout primary is eliminated in RCV. Women, non-whites, all interested candidates can enter a race. They don't need deep pockets just to get on the ballot. Then during the actual election, a voter ranks her choices. She, her first choice will be the candidate of her heart, the one she thinks will be best. But she knows that if that candidate does not win a majority, then her vote will pass on to her second choice, and so forth. There is no such thing as throwing away her vote. Those 100 million non-voters, they didn't vote in 2016 for a variety of reasons. No doubt, however, many simply thought, why bother? It won't make a difference anyway. Ranked choice voting can help make the difference so many want to see, not only in the nation, but in the city of Bloomington. Change will come if more people find value in voting people of all colors and all socioeconomic levels. If I see, if I know there is a real possibility to change the status quo, then I will vote. Americans by the hundreds of thousands have spoken these last weeks. A central issue that has come to the forefront is voting. Americans must go to the polls and vote. 
Ranked choice voting is one way to make higher voter turnout a reality. We cannot afford to miss this opportunity. Please give the city of Bloomington a chance to vote on this important issue. Thank you very much. Maria, for our next caller, could you please patch through Bob Huber? Okay, and for uh, Bob, please press star one on your telephone keypad so that I can open up your line. Again, I'll press star one on your telephone keypad. I guess he is not on the line right now, Chris. Okay. Um, and then our next caller then would be Nan Corliss. Okay. And for Nan Corliss, your line is now open. You may now speak. Can you hear me? Yes, Nan, we can hear you. Okay, I'm Nan Corliss, I'm a Bloomington resident, and thank you for allowing me to comment today on ranked choice voting. I've been an election judge for over 10 years and uh, worked both primary and the November elections, and I've come to see that the time and labor commitment involved in these elections and the low turnout of the primary elections is quite a problem. Um, I have seen the difficulty in recruiting enough election judges for both these elections. So if we eliminate one of them, the primary perhaps, maybe there would be less of a trouble getting election judges and there would be a greater turnout for the November election. Ranked choice voting will attract more diverse group of candidates, I believe, and I also believe that it would cause the candidates to get to know the voters in a deeper way because each one of them has a chance. They know they'll be ranked and each one of them has a chance to make an impression on the voters. I think oftentimes when we have candidates, people make up their mind too soon and they don't know all the candidates that are running. And I am, would love to see the voters make a deep effort and the candidates make a deep effort to get to know each other much better. We could listen to them, meet them, find out how they think. This is all part of a very important process of voting intelligently. Um, it has also been said that ranked choice voting would cause a more civil and less polarizing campaign. And to me, that would be very enlightening. <laughs> Candidates need broad support. And if they are aiming for the first place finish, they will need to campaign far and wide and show their best side to the voters. I'm looking forward to voting for ranked choice vote, voting on the ballot this election, and I certainly hope it will be put on the ballot. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Thank you. Maria, for our next caller, could you patch through Karen Wills? Okay, and for Karen Wills, your, your line is now open. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you very much. This is Karen Wills. Um, let me check to make sure that you can hear me. Yes, Karen, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, I support ranked choice voting for Bloomington as a community organizer and as a faith leader in Bloomington. I am executive director of the Minnesota Unitarian Universalist Social Justice Alliance, and we Unitarians believe that every person matters equally, that we are all in community, and we need one another to participate and thrive. We believe that voting is how we choose people as a community to help determine how to share and pay for the things we all need, like smooth streets and green parks, clean water and good schools. And, and so Unitarians believe that everyone should vote, that it's our shared responsibility to care for the common good. I'm speaking from my faith foundation, but I think that's pretty well in line with many, many other people of faith and people of no faith. 
We also believe that every voter should have fair, unobstructed, equal access to voting, and every candidate should start out with a fair and equal chance of being elected. I think most Americans believe in freedom and in having choices. So I'm troubled that there are voices here who want to prevent a democratic process of consideration of this form of casting our ballots. I'm for RCV because what if the only ice cream flavors were chocolate versus liver sausage crunch? If you are allergic to chocolate, you're really in trouble there. But what if strawberry or butter pecan were choices as well? Maybe we'd all end up with strawberry. Maybe we could live with that. And it might not be our, our number one choice, but at least nobody gets liver sausage crunch. Being able to rank how we all feel about more than two candidates in November elections gives us all a much better chance of electing someone we can feel pretty good about. That then means that elected officials will have a more positive and effective relationship with a real majority of voters. And those positive relationships serve as a solid foundation for good government by the people, of the people, and for the people. Now I'm known by some in town as a pretty fundamentalist Democrat. And you know, that's true. But actually in my day, I have voted for Republicans and I have voted for Democrats because I vote for people that I think are decent and intelligent human beings. Here, that's three minutes. Thank you. Karen, your three minutes are up. Thank you. Um, Maria, would you please patch through caller Kelly Kranz? Okay, and the Kelly Kranz, your line is now open. You may now speak. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Okay, yes, thank we you. Hear there's you. one caller who, who there's one caller earlier who tried to respond but couldn't is trying to call back in. Just wanted to make you aware. Um, so good evening, charter members. My name is Kelly Kranz, young husband and father of two, who grew up here in Bloomington, Minnesota. I've been a resident for over three decades. Um, I'm quite concerned about the heavy responsibility the city council has tasked you with and asked that you reject the proposed amendment to the city charter on ranked choice voting due to inadequate debate, public hearings is substantiated or unsubstantiated. Uh, things on both sides of the issue. Let me illustrate why. Uh, so recently, very unfortunate circumstances occurred in the streets of Minneapolis, a city who elected its leaders with RCV. Showing dismal leadership on that Friday evening in May during violence in his city mayor afraid a little, very little to protect his residents, businesses, or institutions. Not exactly a bastion of leadership we want in Bloomington, but let me show you how he came to be mayor through RCV. Looking at the runoff tabulations from the Minnesota Elections and Voter Services for mayor in 2017, Frey was finally elected in the fifth round over an original 19 candidate with a 44% non-majority of total valid ballots. This most certainly does not prove that the winner is more widely accepted by residents. In the final tally of the 2017 Minneapolis Memorial Race, the same source indicates 21.8% of all ballots cast were exhausted meaning these ballots were not counted. That's nearly a quarter of all votes cast. It surely indicates to me that a quarter of all Minneapolis voters would be a little disenfranchised. Of the 19th total, I guess you could give RCV credit for diverse candidates since Frey ran against Captain Jack Sparrow, an activist in David John Wilson of the Rainbow Butterflies and Unicorns Party, as well as his seven fellow DFL candidates. But anyone can run in a primary system as well. Charter members, so far all the council has heard are positive generalities of what RCV might be able to offer. None of them is very well supported, and by just using a neighborhood RCV community, we can see some of the flaws. But the city council now expects you to approve their inadequate offering. Furthermore, uh, the primary in Wisconsin on April 7th for the state of Wisconsin, state health officials could link no increase in COVID cases in that primary election. So for you to act on a one-sided presentation from last May 2019, where I was cut off and unable, unable to speak during some public comment period, while ignoring the opposing viewpoint is truly a mistake. 
I have faith in you to stop this and alert the city council to do its basic job during these trying times. And there is no compelling right now to change our voting procedure. Thank you for hearing me tonight. Thank you. Maria, would you please patch through John Olson to give testimony? And uh, for John Olson, please press star one on your telephone keypad so that I can open up your line. Okay, and your line is now open. Thank you for the opportunity to offer my thoughts before you make the decisions asked of you tonight. My name is John Olson. I've been a Bloomington resident since 2003. I'm in favor of giving Bloomington voters the opportunity to vote November 3rd for or against using ranked choice voting. My motivation goes back to the 1970s when ninth graders and I, as a teacher, studied how Americans are governed. We did this in classes that were at the time called civics. The courses covered the three branches of government that did the work assigned to them. Perhaps more significantly, the course also stressed the importance of Americans getting involved in our democracy. These 15 year olds and I also talked about the election process. Students were given extra credit for attending caucus meetings and or helping out with campaign activity. We talked about the national and local elections after the results were in. They got a real life lesson in the importance of voting when they saw some election results were delayed due to how close they were some requiring recounts. I'm impressed with the number of people in Bloomington who follow city council and commission meetings. I am, however, saddened and concerned about how few vote in primary elections. It is rare that more than 10% vote in primaries, and typically it's more like five to 7%. I admit that five to 10, to, to admit that five to 10% of the citizens of Bloomington narrow the field of candidates to two is not a good sign for us, not a good sign for democracy in our community. The proposal in front of you gives you the opportunity to do something that can dramatically improve this bad state of affairs. Ranked choice voting removes the need for primaries with several good results. The much, much larger number who vote in general elections will have had the opportunity to examine all office seekers. The election process will be shorter, a relief from the unnecessarily drawn out length we currently endure. We taxpayers will save the money now spent on the August primaries. At a minimum, city staff time, election judges training and stipends, and ballot expenses. Choice voting is a concept that has been around for a long time. It is becoming more commonly used across America and Minnesota. I get that some people have a hard time giving up the way we've always done something. I get that some people get all tangled up in their minds as they get into every conceivable what if. I deplore any statements from either side of this issue who intentionally spread inaccurate information. All I'm asking for you as Charter Commission members is to give the people of Bloomington the opportunity this November 3rd to vote for or against using ranked choice voting to elect our mayor and city council. Thank yeah, you for the opportunity. Three minutes. Thank you. Okay. Maria, would you please ask again if Natalie Morose is on the line? And for Natalie Morose, uh, please press star one on your telephone keypad so that the, I can open up your line. And uh, she is not on the call right now, Chris. Okay. And then let's try our other person one more time, Bob Huber. And for Bob Huber, please press star one so that I can open up your line. And I'm not seeing his line right now. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, those are the individuals that had notified us in advance of their desire to provide testimony that we know for a fact are Bloomington residents. I have six other, excuse me, five other individuals that notified of us, us in advance of their desire to speak whose residency is unknown to me. 
Would you like to move on to those people that notified us in advance, or would you like to go to general callers at this point? Let's let's go on to those that notified us in advance. All righty, thank you. So Deb Brinkman is the next person. Maria, could you pass and through Deb? Deb? Okay, and for Deb Brinkman, please press star one on your telephone keypad. Okay, and Deb, your line is now open. Hello, Charter Commission members. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak on this important issue today. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of St. Louis Park, and I would like to speak of our experience with ranked choice voting. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that encourages informed and active participation in government, works to increase understanding of public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. For 100 years, the League has been empowering voters and defending democracy by engaging all citizens and improving government. Our St. Louis Park League has been advocating for ranked choice voting for many years. We're confident ranked choice voting is a positive approach to increase voter engagement and to improve voter representation. While our legislators deal with polarization and gridlock, adopting RCV for our municipal elections is a change that we can make. Following an exhaustive study of various election methods in 2005, the League of Women Voters Minnesota supports the use of ranked choice voting in local and state elections. Following advocacy efforts in 2017 and 2018, ranked choice voting was endorsed by the League of Women Voters St. Louis Park, Senate District 46 DFL, and the St. Louis Park Human Rights Commission. The St. Louis Park Charter Commission hosted an expert panel and the listening session as they considered ranked choice voting. Resident Judy Cook said that we use the same process when choosing an ice cream cone. Resident Scott Peterson said, our CV is a dream come true. The St. Louis Park Charter Commission voted for a favorable review of ranked choice voting. Our St. Louis Park City Council then unanimously voted in favor of ranked choice voting. Last year, St. Louis Park held its first um, RCV election. I was a candidate for city council on that ballot. We appreciate that change takes effort. Thankfully, we were able to leverage the experience in Minneapolis and St. Paul to create a plan to mitigate concerns or complications. Exit polling shows that 92% of Minneapolis voters find RCV simple and easy to use. 85% of voters in St. Paul find RCV simple and easy to use. These percentages continue to increase each year. Education plays a key role in those high percentages. Our St. Louis Park staff did a terrific job of training and communication in preparation of our election. One of the highlights was a partnership with Johnny Pop at the Summer Park Pacular. League of Women Voters St. Louis Park and Fair Vote Minnesota supported the city education at the grassroots level. As a candidate, when I campaigned door to door, I found our residents were overwhelmingly supportive of the RCV process. There was no negative campaigning. And while I did not win, I did come in second place. The second choice votes provide very oh, important insight into what voters up. want. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Maria, would you please connect through caller Amber Bernhardt? Okay. And for Amber Bernhardt, your line is now open. Hello, Charter members. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, Amber, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Hello, Charter members. My name is Amber Bernhardt, and I've lived in Bloomington pretty much my whole life. I'm calling in this evening to let my voice be heard in total opposition to ranked choice voting. This way of voting, in my opinion, is a complete scam. Here are my reasons why I say this. One, it compromises my vote. When I go to the voting booth, I want it to be clear and easy, and I want to know that my vote counts. One choice equals one vote. With ranked choice voting, we as residents have no idea if our vote will be counted or if it will be simply thrown out. Number two, why are outside influences like Fair Vote Minnesota meddling with our elections? 
It has come to my attention that some of our city council members and mayor have had their campaigns funded by these people in exchange for their push to ram rank choice vote, excuse me, rank choice voting down Bloomington residents' throats. This is not okay. Three, rank choice voting is not essential business during a pandemic. There has not been enough education on ranked choice voting, and in the end, it will cost more. Therefore, I am asking you, the charter members, to please reject the proposed amendments to the city charter today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Maria, would you please patch through Casey Carl? Okay, and for Casey, uh, Casey Carl? Is that Casey Carl? Casey Carl, C A R L. Okay, and for Casey Carl, please press star one on your telephone keypad so that I can open up your line. And I think she is not on the call right now. Okay. Um, next caller would be Jean Massey. And for Jean Massey, please press star one on your telephone keypad so that I can open up your line. And Jean, your line is now open. Great, and, and you can hear me? Yes, Jean, we can hear you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jean Massey and I'm the Executive Director of Fair Vote Minnesota. We are a statewide nonprofit and nonpartisan organization that seeks to protect Minnesota's elections and strengthen our democracy for future generations. I'm also an election judge. Our organization has spoken with hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans about ranked choice voting and how it can improve local elections by lowering administrative costs, empowering voters with more choice and more voice, encouraging greater consensus and civility, and ensuring that winners are broadly supported by voters without the need for an extra runoff election. During the past decade, ranked choice voting has been adopted in a growing number of cities across the United States, from large cities like New York City to small cities like St. Louis Park, which you just heard, and successfully implemented ranked choice voting in 2019 for their municipal elections. Now more than 20 cities are using or are slated to use ranked choice voting across the country and dozens more are exploring making the switch to this system. The state of Maine now also uses ranked choice voting for statewide primaries and congressional elections and more states are looking to adopt ranked choice voting statewide. In none of the cities where ranked choice voting is used are voters or election administrators looking to go back to their old voting systems. That's because RCV is popular among voters who like having more voice and ranked choice voting has been used across the country at a scale now to which election administrators have ample access to resources and technology to implement the system successfully and with full confidence. You may know that congressional uh, member Dean Phillips has recently introduced federal legislation to provide additional federal resources for cities and states that are making the transition to ranked choice voting. More cities are persuaded by the variety of benefits ranked choice voting has demonstrated in cities where it's used, including higher voter turnout, more diversity of candidates and winners, more civil campaigns, one less election to administer, and elected leaders representing a broad majority of voters in their communities. Since the first ranked choice voting election in Minnesota, there have been more than 545,000 ranked ballots that have been successfully cast to determine winners in 102 municipal races with 374 candidates in these cities. In other words, there has been a vast uh, degree of experience now with ranked choice voting and it is very proven. Nearly 90% of voters choose to rank more than one candidate on their ballot in most of the races and over 90% consistently express their preference for the system and their uh, uh, satisfaction with using ranked choice voting. In St. Louis Park last year, which you just heard, voter turnout increased by nearly 50% in the November election, up from... Sure, that's uh, three minutes. Your time is up. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Maria, would you patch through Carter Glendenning? Carter Glendenning. 
And for Carter blend blending, please press star one. Okay, and uh, Carter, your line is now open. Okay, great. Thank you for having me speak tonight. I'm a former uh, Bloomington resident, having lived there for, for two decades. But I'm calling because I'm very familiar with fair, joy, fair uh, choice voting, and I'd like to uh, directly speak to you Charter Commission people. I just heard the Minnetonka, where I now live, Charter Commission uh, speak on this very topic, because fair voting is there too. And uh, Mr. Ellendorf, if you know him, he expressed this comment. I'd like you to put in your in your heads for a minute. He asked the other charter members, quote, ask yourself, what is RCV supposed to fix? Ask yourself, what is RCV supposed to fix? Voter turnout? Well, studies in Duluth, and I'm from Duluth originally, and St. Paul has not increased voter turnout. So that's a fact. We heard a lot of these several people say in a lot of uh, generality is how great it is. But the fact is, the number one voting group in Bloomington are the senior voters. They represent the largest voting block in Bloomington, and their votes will be jeopardized by our city, contrary to what's being said by Fairfield, Minnesota. How do I know? I'm 80 years old, and I have friends in the 70 to 85 age uh, bracket, and I've explained our CV to them, as others have, on numerous occasions and they still do not comprehend what's going on. So that's a big factor. That's a big voting block for you, for you folks. And no matter how clear the instructions are, these people still do get mixed up. And finally, large concern, concerns loom on the horizon if ranked choice voting is chosen by Bloomington. Proponents of RCV in their informational papers say that it was, quote, a resounding success. But the voters themselves are saying in Duluth, where I'm from, and I have relatives there, that the least qualified candidates seem to win year after year. A good example of what was mentioned here just a few minutes ago, Jacob Fry and how he's running Minneapolis. It's a disaster. In Maine, where I heard somebody just earlier also praise Maine, in their ranked choice voting about four years ago, they chose a candidate who only won 37% of the vote, and then the winner, the, who has a fourth person, he ended up winning. And he's quoted in the paper as advocating for duels and compared the IRS to G Gestapo. And lastly, let's talk about Alaska. The headlines in the Alaska newspaper was, RCV fails to produce true majority winners because the RCV system exhausts voter ballots. Proponents of RCV propagate misleading information such as, quote, evidence has shown time and again, again, the voters find RCV simple. If the actual voters were queried, you'd find the statement untrue. And just one more comment and I'm done. That, sure, that's that three fair minutes. Fair vote Minnesota is in is fact up. promoted time is up. by Thank a guy you. named uh, Patamar Your time is and up, George sir. Soros. Your time is up, Thank sir. You. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All right. And then, Mr. Chair, I've been informed via email that uh, Natalie Morose is trying to get through and having some di difficulty. I was asked to call on her um, a third time to see if the technology challenges had been addressed. So, Maria, would you try once again to see if Natalie Morose is on the line? Okay, and for Natalie, please press star one on your telephone keypad. And she hasn't dialed in yet. I'm not okay, seeing her. Okay. I'm not seeing her on the line. One more call for Bob Huber. And again for Bob Huber, please press star one on your telephone keypad. And he is also not on the call right now. And last person, Casey Carl. And for Casey Carl, please press star one on your telephone keypad. Again, a Casey Carr, please press star one. Hello. Hello, Casey. We can hear you. Oh, good. Um, good evening. Thank you for the time. My name is Casey Carl. I have the privilege of being the clerk in the city of Minneapolis. 
Um, I am also a resident of Minneapolis. Um, as you know, we adopted ranked choice voting for our municipal elections in 2006. We've successfully used that methodology in the three last cycles, 2009, 13, and 17. This year, we're administering our first special municipal election using ranked choice voting in August, which is in conjunction with the statewide primary to fill a vacancy on our city council. I wanted to note for your record, our experiences in Minneapolis uh, with ranked choice voting, which have realized many of the outcomes desired by our electorate um, since 2006. Specifically, we've seen campaigning become less polarizing and personal, been more focused on policy priorities and issue-based campaigns. We've seen a shift that favors and empowers the voter because candidates ask if they can secure the voter second or even third rank if they can't be first. We've seen increased use of ranked options used on the ballot. We've seen more competitive races up and down with more candidates in all races on the ballot. And the results have been a more diverse body of policymakers, one of the most diverse the city's ever had. In fact, today we have both one of the oldest council members and the youngest on record serving on the same body. We have a good mix of individuals representing diverse indicators for both race, ethnicity, economic status, education, religious affiliation, professional backgrounds, experience, and, and more. And as for voter turnout, well, we've seen our voter engagement turnout increase year after year over the last three cycles using RCV. In fact, in 2017, we achieved a 41% voter turnout, which for context is comparable to the turnout we would expect to achieve in a midterm gubernatorial election. And finally, in your role as Charter Commission, I would say to you, it is entirely appropriate to submit this question to your voters. After all, government begins at the ballot box, and it should be a matter for voters to decide the type and form of government they wish to have for themselves and how that system is chosen. It's entirely appropriate to give all of your voters an equal voice in that decision by referring the question to the ballot box. And my purpose in speaking to you tonight was to express my support for your city's efforts to consider ranked choice voting and to ensure you that my office stands ready to support and provide any resources or assistance Bloomington might need, as well as my colleague, Janet Lewis, who is well respected uh, amongst all clerks in the state. We would want you to have a successful implementation should that proposal be approved and are eager to help. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Maria, I do not have any other callers to call by name. Could you uh, please patch through any additional callers that are on the line wishing to speak? Okay, and we have a Colton Kranz on the line. Your line is still open. Damn, that was the hardest thing to get into in my life. Good evening, your members. My name is Colton Kranz. Born and raised in Bloomington and now a businessman. Tonight I'm asking the commission to reject the proposed amendment to the city charter on ranked choice voting, mainly because the city has not done its job to adequately vet all the claims made by supporters of RCV. The city charter is Bloomington's constitution. Changing the way we vote in our community should not be taken lightly or rushed. In our view, this should not be pushed to the November 2020 ballot without fur further public discussions and debate. For the staff briefing, timing was crucial. If the council wanted to get this on the November 2020 ballot, but no other urgency has been noted during the worst year in memory. Saving a few bucks on elimination of a primary is a myth. I'd like to take the opportunity to prove it. How do we effectively engage in a city council very limited public comment session during a pandemic and so late at night. In fact, how does a city have eight effective, transparent, and informative public comment periods in one meeting? I know one of Bloomington residents that was on hold and it inadvertently dismissed from the public comment period on the RCV ordinance very late in the night uh, of this ordinance recommendation. This COVID method of communication is inadequate for resident feedback. Council spotty conversations and various meetings over the last year do not constitute full engagement and discussion with the people served. A year ago, in the May, in the May 16, 2019 joint meeting, there was some discussion on RCV. Information was presented by staff as to their perception, to their perception of the advantages of RCV, but no mention of any downside to the city or disadvantages to the voter. Staff was directed on next steps for this discussion. 
former Mayor Winstead suggested having additional study meetings on the topic. However, search of both City Council and Charter Commission minutes on the City's website found no further public RCV presentations or information. Other organizations were active during the summer before the 2019 municipal elections. The League of Women Voters, along with Fair Vote Minnesota, hosted several promotional opportunities for citizens to support ranked choice voting, and candidates and council members appeared in support. The, seri the seriousness of the topic for charter action and consideration was fleeting at best. The very fact the city council had to call a special charter commission meeting just for RCV, instead of finding solutions for the residents and businesses that are being crushed by this pandemic, is proof of the disregard the City Council has for the residents of Bloomington. For these reasons, I am asking the Commission to reject the proposed amendment to the City Charter on ranked choice voting, mainly because the City has Here, not three done minutes. its job. That all the claims. Sorry, are your time is up. Are... Your time is Thank up. Thank you. you for your comments. Next caller, please, Maria. And your next person on the line is Gianna Dagiel. Your line is now open. Okay, hi. Thank you for the time to speak tonight. I'm a longtime Bloomington resident. And um, if the council votes against putting the RCV on the November ballot, then the council is, in effect, making a decision for all voters to reject RCV for the first follow-on election where it could have been adopted. And to me, that's not democratic, and it's right to give voters a chance. Um, enough people have heard of RCB because it's been adopted for a while um, in cities throughout the nation and definitely here in Minnesota. And so it's time to put it up to a vote. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please, Maria. And your next person on the line is James Lund. Your line is now open. All right, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you very much. And thank you for the operator for your patience and resolve for allowing us all on. I deserve a great deal of thanks. But good evening, commissioners and council member Beloga, James Lund, resident and voter from the great city of Bloomington. Before I go into my stance, my reasoning is based upon the leadership by example, by Walter Mondale, former president, excuse me, former United States Senator from Minnesota and the Vice President of the United States. Walter and other members of the City Council of Duluth were stood in opposition to ranked choice voting. Because of that leadership by example, I stand against uh, ranked choice voting here in Bloomington. And I'm just gonna make my time quick here, but there's a very good uh, article by Tom Olson of the Duluth Tribune but I'll make sure that you all get a chance to get a break. But again, James Lund from Bloomington, thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you. Next caller, please, Maria. And your next caller on the line is Mia Alton. Your line is now open. Mia Hi, Alton, can you hear me? your line is now open. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hi. Um, yes, my name is Maya Olson, and I've been a resident of Bloomington for 31 years. Um, I happen to have volunteered on a recount effort for a city council vote in 2017, and I was struck by the number of voters who voted for one candidate when given the, cho given the choice to vote for three out of 11 candidates on the school board. RCV would give people more confidence in voting for their second and third choices without worrying about knocking their first choice out of the race. Many of the arguments that I've heard are that RCV would be too complicated. Um, it is only as complicated as people make it out to be. If they still want to vote for one candidate, they are still able to do so. If they would like to research more candidates, they may rank as many as they are comfortable ranking. This would be beneficial to all voters. Concerning my own school board race in 2019, someone against RCB said to me, maybe you would have lost your school board race if there had been ranked choice voting. My response to this is that I would have accepted that outcome as being very fair. 
And in fact, if I decide to run again when my term is up, I hope that Bloomington has the opportunity has the opportunity to vote via RCV. And that is all. <laughs> Thank you. Next caller, please, Maria. And your next caller on the line is David Olson. Your line is now open. Hello, thank you. This could be the best three minutes of my day. I really appreciate the time to participate. Uh, you know, the chance for citizens to take part in this, um, it's fabulous, it's thrilling, it's a testament to our form of civil government. Um, you know, I am a citizen of Bloomington, but I am speaking to you from my office in Minneapolis near the third precinct. We unboarded our building you know, a week ago Monday, you know, Minneapolis is an amazing, powerful, and vibrant city. And for a lot of people in the suburbs, it's, it's a foreign place. They just don't know it. You know, this past election cycle, it kind of became apparent to me in Bloomington that there, are, there were a lot of dog whistles going on, and some people are considered more Bloomington than others. You know, for me, we first moved off the farm and on the Lindale Avenue in 1967. Might have been 68. When I graduated from Bloomington Lincoln in 81, I couldn't leave fast enough to expand my horizons and see all kinds of other places, East Coast to West Coast and Arctic Circle to Antarctic Circle. But I can remember how much I loved Bloomington. And in 1995, I returned to Bloomington for two reasons. One, the love of my life. And second, Bloomington's an awesome place. We've got a great city going on and we gotta keep that going. And I remember growing up on Lindale, then Aldrich, then Gerard, then Fremont, listening to the adults talk about how they had their candidate of choice, but there were other candidates, boy, I, you know, I could be okay with this one or that one as well, but I sure don't want this one and the other one. And when I look back on it and I think about how they were talking, they were talking about the simple thing that they wanted to be able to rank the candidates in order of their preference. You know, once I became an active voting adult, I could see the same thing. It's like, I love this one, this is my first choice, but hey, I like second and third, but I don't want these other ones. You know, I would love to hear a candidate speak to me saying, I know I'm not your first choice, but I don't want to alienate you. How can I win you over? You know, how can somebody reach out to me? And as a voter, I want my full intentions to be recognized and reflected in the results and to be actualized as a voter. And I, I would just be so thrilled to have someone know that they might be my second or third choice and they're still working for that vote. And all we're asking you to do tonight is just give us, as voters of Bloomington, the opportunity to decide up or down. People who are against it, they'll have plenty of time to say why ranked choice voting is bad. And of course, it's fine. It's very interesting to hear that the pandemic is an issue because it seems to me a lot of people against ranked choice voting also are not so sure that this COVID thing's even real to begin with or that our restrictions against it are so harsh. So just give us a chance. Please give us a chance as Bloomington voters to make a decision whether we want to go with ranked choice voting or not. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's been a lot of fun. I love listening to all of this. Thank you. Maria, the next caller, please. And your next caller on the line is Perry McInderoy. Your line is open. Hello. Hello. Oh, thank you. Uh, good evening, evening, Charter members. My name is Terry McEnroy, and I'm a Bloomington citizen for over 30 years. Thank you for this time tonight. An important decision like this should involve the best citizen engagement and discussion. And I personally oppose uh, the RCB yeah. Charter Amendment yeah. based on two key I don't know observations. I home here, but it's running later than I thought. Sorry about I, that. Please continue. Talk over my, okay. Uh, number one, the Bloomington citizens have not received a thorough review or discussion of this charter, pros and cons from the city leaders. And number two, although I originally had no position one way or another about this issue, I started researching the claims made by RCV supporters. The many claims did not match up to the extensive RCV election research and studies. I want to talk about the city uh, citizen engagement or the lack thereof. We need to go back to almost a full year ago on May 16, 2019, during a study meeting when this topic was presented to the council. Upon completion of that meeting, the former mayor and additional council members asked for more follow-up information. There is, no informa there is no evidence that this uh, promise of information was followed through on. And then we fast forward a year later to April 20th, 2020 council meeting, and the council members are asking the city attorney how to best expedite this process to the Charter Commission. There's no discussion at all on the pros and cons or merits of this charter to citizens. 
No discussion on costs or key information to provide citizens to be informed. Citizens deserve better. And I'd like you to consider when this all happened. It happened during the COVID-19. And when you think about the challenges facing the residents, think about it this way. It's a worldwide pandemic. All our personal lives are changed immediately, including businesses shut down, protecting family members, how we manage work during a pandemic, how we provide schooling for children, uh, shopping shortages for foods and supplies. Along with this is an economic collapse, record unemployment, businesses closing, exploding budget shortfalls with state and city budgets, decreasing and elimination of city service and possible huge property tax increases. Then we're gonna add one more layer onto this with the recent events, witnessing the recent tragic killing of the Minneapolis citizen, George Floyd. The worldwide protests, especially those in Minneapolis, close to home, including the burning and looting of businesses, homes and shops, the curfews, and the discussions of funding and dismantling of police departments. So where would the RCV charter amendment rank in the Bloomington citizen's mind as this being important, especially when concern and uncertainty uncertainty fill their minds with ongoing going pandemic and economic collapse. I would like to talk to you then about some research and just share to you three points. RCV claims save cities election costs. In the 2012 RCV election, Minneapolis spent 1,700,000. The RCV process cost Minneapolis five times as much as the traditional way of plurality voting. Minneapolis made up the shortfall of 385,000 in 2013 by not hiring vacant staff positions. We don't have that luxury if that happens. And the Minneapolis City Council member, Gidden, who also chaired the elections committee and was also an early RCV advocate stated, I wish the claimed election savings had not been used by RCV advocates. Seven years Last later, time. they're still stating the same false claim. Thank you. Time is up. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Maria, would you please patch through the next caller? Okay, and your next person on the line is Jim Bowen. Your line is open. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you. My name is Jim Bowen. I'm a Bloomington resident, 8083 Kentucky Circle, and I'm opposed to putting RCV on the November ballot. It is a major distraction from tackling the huge problems that resulted from the COVID-19 virus. We need all our time to focus on recovery from the economic habit, havoc that's been wreaked by the pandemic. We're facing, facing somewhere up to $17 million budget shortfall. It makes no sense to dilute the city's focus and spend extra resources on RCV during this time. And second, I guess, in spite of all the wonderful sounding advantages claimed by the RCV proponents, the results are at best mixed. And there are, I, for every every claim that they have come up with tonight, I found in my research that there are, there are lots of negatives. Let me give a couple examples. Um, first one is that RCV promotes majority support. Well, even with RCV, you often fail to get a candidate with a majority of the vote. I fail to understand how if I rank a candidate as number four or five, and that person wins, how that how I'm supporting that candidate. A one uh, 2015 study on four RCV elections in Washington State and California found no winners with a majority uh, vote at that and in any of those four elections. Uh, another uh, one of the claims is that promotes reflective representation that somehow using RCV allows a more diverse group of voters to elect. Uh, candidates of choice with diverse political views, backgrounds, and demographics, i.e. RCV can promote representation of, of uh, historically underrepresented uh, voting groups. And I, if you think about it, it, that makes absolutely no sense, especially in single, uh, you know, single winner elections. That uh, it, it just doesn't make sense. We're I'm trying to understand how, how that would work. Now I can understand if it was somehow rather than a multi-winner election, there might be more groups that would participate and somehow or other be able to, to rise up. But my real concern is that there hasn't been any sort of what I would, I would consider to be a, a valid objective look at this from the, from the city of Bloomington perspective. My background is project management. You, you understand something, you have to develop a cost and a schedule 
and understand what the proposed benefits are. I haven't seen that for this. This is a pig in a poke. And uh, I think there's, there's, there's been a lack of uh, leadership management as far as, uh, as far as this whole process. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Next caller, please, Maria. And your next person on the line is Stacy Brittle. Your line is open. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Stacy, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I have been listening to all of this and learning so much. And I haven't prepared a long, eloquent speech. Um, I heard the gentleman from Minnetonka speak about the senior population voting in Bloomington, and it is a very large voting block. And I do fall in that block. And he said, no matter how much you explain all of this to the seniors, some of us are not going to get it. I think I kind of get it, but I come to the conclusion after listening all night that I feel very much that if I cast my vote, it should be counted as I cast it, and it should be left alone. Ranked choice voting muddies up the waters of clear voting, and it causes confusion. So I'm asking you, please do not put ranked choice voting on the ballot in November. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Next caller, please, Maria. And your uh, last caller on the line is Beth Beeb. Your line is open. Hi, my name is Beth, and I live in Bloomington for 20 years. I am asking that you do not cast that amendment. Caller, we heard you very briefly say hello, but we cannot hear what you are saying now. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, now I hear Hello. you. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I actually have lived in Bloomington for 20 years, and I have been very active in the community. I also ran an election in which there were 12 candidates. I ended up working as hard as possible. I was an unknown person, and I worked hard. I went up and down streets. I went as far as I could to meet people. And I, I was one of four candidates that were elected. And I even beat out an incumbent. It takes a lot of work. And that's how you get elected. I also, and because some of the people have been saying, oh, well, these other people don't have a chance. Well, you have to work hard. The other thing is, I'm wondering, why does Bloomington need frank choice voting? What election problems force such a change to our charter, our constitution? When I did research on an unbiased um, uh, fact-finding mission, I found Ballotpedia, which I've gone to in the past to get information. They did a review of ranked choice voting, and it ends up that the information we've been receiving tonight would make one think that this is being the nation. When in actuality, there are only 13 states that allow this for municipal um, elections, and only one that allows it for federal and state. Of um, 11 states that allow it for municipalities, um, there are actually only 21 cities that have adopted ranked choice voting. Of those that have adopted it, only 13 cities have implemented it. Among them is New York City. It, it adopted it, but it has not implemented it. It makes you wonder why they haven't implemented it. Perhaps there's things that aren't there, like on our city website. I was told it would be there to educate us. The mayor said it would be. I went to it. It has no cons. It only has pros, and it's very limited. Therefore, I think, and I know other voters would think the same way, we don't have enough information. The other thing is, 
why are these other places not implementing it? Someone also mentioned that Dean Phillips was asking for funding from the federal, federal government in order to implement it. Doesn't that tell you that it's beyond the cost of what we normally use? So I think there's a lot of questions, and I think some of those arguments actually do not hold water. And where we've been told information of how many thousands of people they've talked to, sometimes the message three minutes. is only one-sided. So time thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Maria, did I hear you correctly that that was our last caller? Uh, we have a additional caller on the line. Okay, please go ahead. Um, okay. And uh, we have Yaye Mohammed on the line. Please, uh, yes. you may now speak. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, thank you so much. Um, as a community organizer, African immigrant, and 10 years resident of Bloomington, uh, my wife and I and my three children, uh, we raised it here. And uh, I would like to see city leaders work with residents to make changes that will make our city a better place for people of color. For example, the city council and the charter commission are considered both in rank, rank choice voting on the ballot for voters in, in November. I hope they do, and I hope it passes. RCV can help be improve representation of people of color and the issue they care about it. It, it eliminates the low turnout local primary and encourages new, new diversity candidates to run and have their voices heard through November. When voter turnout is higher and more diverse, other cities using RCP have, have seen increases in diversity candidates and voter participation. I hear people say RCP is not confused, is confusing. It's not. It seems because there is just a one election and we just a big which candidates our first, second, third choice. Bolivian can be a leader in making our democracy more inclusive, inclusive and representation. I hope we take this in, uh, uh, in November. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Does that conclude our callers? Yes, we don't have any further comments from the caller. Mr. Chair, that is the callers that we have. Um, if you so chose to um, close the public hearing, we could let Maria go for the evening. Um, uh, or that you would can... be, you, you can let her go. Uh, I will look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved by Peterson. Second. By Hunt. Motion by Peterson, second by Hunt. We will now do a roll call vote to close the public hearing. Denise. Thank you. Axtell. Aye. Aloga. Aye. Barnes. I see he's on mute, but I did hear his, see his mouth moving. Sorry about that. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Hi. Um, Vermont. One more time, Commissioner Goodermont. Hi. Hunt. Hi. Nelson. Hi. Steve Peterson. Hi. Stanley. Hi. Thorson. Weatherby. Aye. Motion to close up public hearing passes unanimously. Uh, on to uh, discussion commissioners. Excuse me, Mr. Chair, just a moment. Oh, sure. Maria, thank you, thank you for being with us tonight. You can disconnect from the call. Okay, sure, I will disconnect the call now. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. All right, commissioners, would anybody like to open up the discussion? Okay. Commissioner Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, I think of, um, I wonder if the, I know it's a little bit noisy for people to mute who might not be muted right now. Um, so I think of questions that come to us of kind of being of two different forms. There are um, questions that are um, destined for kind of the seven vote approval process at the city council. And I think with those, we have a pretty high bar. Uh, to make sure that those 
um, that those sorts of changes in our assessment meet the will of the voters in the city. Um, what's being proposed here isn't that sort of change. Um, what we're being asked is we're being asked to put something on the ballot, which means basically what we're being asked to do is kind of assess whether there's enough support in the community for us to put this on the ballot for voters to consider and for voters to make the decision about whether um, this particular proposal should be adopted. So um, personally, um, I don't think it's necessary to, to form an opinion about ranked choice voting in order to put it on the ballot. I think it, you just, it just needs to meet the bar that there's enough community interest in it that it has, um, that it's not obviously bad for the city. And I think if you listen to the testimony there, if there's clearly a disagreement about it, but it's not obviously bad. Um, and then we allow the marketplace of ideas to work and allow the, because clearly there's people on both sides of the issue that will be out there communicating. Um, and then ultimately allow the voters to decide on this question. And so because of that, I intend to support putting this on the ballot in the fall. Mark, you're muted now, so you got to unmute. About that, uh, who else would like to speak on this item? Raise your hand. Oh, Commissioner Barnes. I, uh, I, I think uh, uh, that uh, we should have a motion on the floor to discuss, and so I'm willing to um, uh, move to adopt the approval. Of the proposed amendment to the city charter and set forth in ordinance 2020-17 adopted by the city council on May 18th, 2020, and directing the city attorney to promptly notify the city council of the action taken. Anybody ready to make a second on that? I'll second that motion. Uh, Rose Peterson. Right. We have a motion and a second to get back to discussion. Anybody, would anyone else like to add to the discussion on this one way or the other? Commissioner Nelson. So I, I have a couple of just factual questions. What was the vote on the city council? Mr. Chair, I do not recall off the top of my head, but if you'd like to go on to the next question, we can look that up and have it for you in just a couple of moments. Okay. Um, the, the second question I think is, is more conceptual. As I understand it from the chair and from many of the comments, the question is not whether we agree or disagree with ranked choice voting, but whether it should be submitted to the voters for their decision. If I look at the draft of the motion though and i think uh, as i heard the motion the draft of the motion is that the charter commission approves the amendment rather than approves the submission of the amendment to the voters so i'm wondering whether or not the procedural status is is correct here right if all we're doing is deciding whether to submit it to the voters, then it seems to me that the motion should be that we agree to approve the submission of the proposed amendment to the voters for their decision. Melissa. Chair, uh, Chair and Commissioners, uh, the ordinance that's attached to the uh, resolution before you for consideration tonight is an ordinance requesting voter approval to amend chapter four and then the effective date of of that ordinance uh, states that this ordinance shall be in full of force and effect 30 days from the date of the 2020 state general election so long as 51 percent of the votes cast are in favor of the adoption of the charter amendments set forth in sections one through three of this ordinance and then the, in accordance with states state statutes and then it lists the specific statutes so I believe that this particular ordinance is properly formatted uh, in that it's requesting voter approval and it will not go into effect unless it is adopted by the voters at the state general election in November. But then doesn't that suggest that the charter that the charter commission agrees with the amendment rather than agrees that the amendment should be submitted to the voters? Chair? Uh, Melissa. 
Uh, chair and members, uh, I, uh, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, the resolution is approving the ordinance and the ordinance is seeking to place this on the agenda or excuse me on the ballot. Um, and it will not go into effect unless it's approved by the voters at the election. So, again, all right, if that's the interpretation, I take it that the prevailing interpretation is that voting yes on the proposed motion does not mean that the Charter Commission approves of the amendment, but only that the amendment should be submitted to the voters for their decision. Chair members, that is the that is the intent of the drafter and the drafter is me. So. Yes. Thank you very much. Do we have an answer to that first question? Yes, Chair, I have the answer to that. Um, at the May 18th City Council meeting, the vote to approve ordinance requesting voter approval to amend Chapter 4 of the City Charter related to the rate choice voting method for electing the Mayor and City Council members carried 7 to 0. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, see any other hands up here? Uh, Commissioner Stanley. Um, let me preface my remarks uh, by saying I'm in favor, at this point, I'm pretty much in favor of ranked choice voting. That, I know that's not the issue tonight. But I just want you to understand that I, I kind of like a lot of things about it, although I, I take everybody's statements that I don't believe anybody about anything. Uh, but I'm just opposed to putting it on the ballot this time for all sorts of reasons. Uh, the circumstance, the obvious circumstances that we're all, everybody, ourselves included, are dealing with in terms of communications and uh, how difficult it is to communicate about some things. And, and uh, there's no reason to believe that it's a for the rest of our city uh, to to uh, operate efficiently and effectively, uh, to be able to understand what we need to understand. Um, I think the timing is just flat out bad. I think the city has a, a, a growing list of things that are more important to deal with at this time than to even spend a lot of time uh, on this subject at all now and i would rather see that uh, the two sides uh, slug it out in the trenches for another couple of years two years four years uh, i'm in favor of having it on a major election cycle i think that's when we get a, we all recognize that we get more voters now at that time um and if it ends up that we have to wait uh, four years but or at least two years i have no problem with that like i say i just don't think it's that important an issue for our city at this time even though i like this time, so far as what I've heard and understand, uh, I, I lean towards it. I guess that's it. Thank you. Anyone else to speak? Commissioner Beloga. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm also going to vote in opposition to putting this on the ballot at this time. And uh, it's for the reason uh, that has been spoken to by both Commissioner Stanley and Nelson before me. Um, in addition, uh, at the March 16th meeting, which was the city council meeting that uh, the council approved the mayor's uh, uh, emergency declaration, uh, our city manager and mayor both said at that time that uh, because of COVID, we would focus on two items. The first were those that were statutorily required. Second would be any item that was necessary to the uh, running of the enterprise, the city. And I don't see that ranked choice voting falls in either of those uh, characterizations. And I may be a very old fashioned type of person, 
but I believe strongly that a person, or in this case, a city's word, is how you develop trust between parties, that meaning the city and its residents. So because of that, and without making comment to the uh, points of uh, expressed by the many people, uh, which interestingly or not, our residents came out uh, 13 to 13 by my uh, count. Um, I, uh, I, I cannot support uh, uh, this uh, amendment or uh, uh, ordinance. Anyone else who wish to speak on this? Um, I would just add my two cents worth. Uh, I, I believe that with a unanimous vote on the city council to move this forward to the charter commission and despite all of what's kind of going on in the world today i think between now and the election there's adequate time for people to educate yeah. themselves on break choice voting oh commissioner hunt i'll get back to you um and so i will be uh moving in favor of it commissioner hunt Actually, Commissioner Axtell was had his hand before me. Oh, okay. Commissioner Axtell? Yeah, my arm is getting sore. Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's okay. That's okay. It's it's 9.15. But you just a, a couple of comments is that, you know, I'm probably a little disappointed in the council and the city manager for uh, for putting this on the table considering what we're going through right now. I think the timing is very poor. Uh, personally, I haven't come to my own conclusions as to whether I like it or don't like it. Uh, I do have a concern about uh, the cities that uh, that have adopted it, and, uh, and I'm not so sure that the system in Bloomington is broken. However, with that said, is that I kind of look at this as somewhat of a horse race. we got two parties to it, one group that is passionate about uh, ranked choice voting, and the other group is kind of late to the game. So it's kind of like letting the one horse out and they're halfway around the ring and uh, you know, we got five months for the other side to, to catch up. So because of that, I am not gonna support it. Commissioner Nelson. Um, just to follow up, um... I, I I heard my name mentioned. I, I, my comments did not suggest that I um, uh, oppose this. I support submitting this to the voters. Um, I, I don't I don't actually see these times as uh, getting in the way of our considering this, and, and especially with the city council voting seven to zero, um, unless the city council has changed its mind about whether they want us to consider this. It seems to me that first we should consider it. And second, uh, we should, res I, my inclination is to respect the city council's vote. It also looks to me as if much of what uh, the city is doing now is opening up. I'm looking at the website and Bush Lake Beach is opening up. The ice garden is opening up. Uh, lots of Bloomington activities are now coming back uh, 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 into uh, activity here, so so I I don't I don't see the problem with the timing. I don't see the city council on a seven to zero vote saying that this isn't the right time to do it. And if it, as long as it's a question of whether or not the voters should uh, consider it and decide it, it seems to me that's the that's the pathway that we should follow. Thank you, Commissioner Hunt. You had your hand up a while ago. Commissioner Hunt, am I on mute? You are. You are. You're, I can. We can hear you now. Okay. Thank you. Um, at this point, I'm not going to be supporting the motion. I don't feel it's the appropriate time. I do think at some point it should go before a vote. But um, again, uh, for reasons also um, stated previously, it's not an essential part um, of what the city should be doing. And yes, while things are opening. We're certainly where we're sitting is not in City Hall in front of a public hearing either. And 
I would venture, even though things are opening, people still have many other things on their plate to uh, to consider. I think it's poor timing. I think the uh, um, commentary about um, people uh, being well aware of this are, um, I think perhaps those those individuals and certainly our, our council might be misinformed if they think that because of discussions and so forth of two years, um, and the reference that the charter has had it in discussion for one year. Um, I don't think one night and then again a year later is enough to make that um, decision. I don't have any compelling reason to support it at this time. I've tried to listen with an open mind, um, but yet the the reasons for um, are are spoken in generalities without supporting information. I've heard enough contrary. On the other side, that would raise a question really as to what, um, whether there is uh, any savings or um, additional or, um, reason to move to something like that in a system that doesn't seem um, inappropriate at this time. So at this point, I would be not supporting the motion at all. Uh, Commissioner Beloga. <laughs> uh, thank you. A couple of you have mentioned the city council vote to 7 0. Yeah. And as I participated in that vote, I would like to uh, uh, provide you some insight since I did vote for it to go to uh, the Charter Commission. Uh, my motivations to vote uh, to send it to the Charter Commission was is that uh, it appeared that uh, it was not giving a fair and open hearing in my estimation uh, in front of Council and that uh, we had uh, very few uh, participants in the public hearing. Uh, as a result, it seemed like the best option to be as far as hearings go is, is to present it to uh, the Charter Commission. Uh, that that would be a full and more complete hearing on the matter than what Council appeared to be willing to provide us. That uh, I hope helps to have context to at least one of those votes. Uh, for those of you who uh, believe that the uh, vote of council uh, was uh, uh, something other than what I perceive it to have been. A question for uh, Commissioner Beloga. Um, just curious, do you feel like um, the opportunity that you know that that citizens and others have had a better opportunity than this evening to to speak their piece on it than what occurred in the city council forum. Uh, Mr. Chair, I I uh, firmly believe that there has been a much better airing, but as uh, Commissioner Axtell also mentioned, I believe in a fairness of uh, uh, of hearing things on both sides. And for the public to hear this issue, uh, this has been, um, I think, in front of council for three years in very general terms where uh, people have spoken to the council, uh, for instance, from the St. Louis Park uh, 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 perspective of what they did and why they did it. and more or less promoting it and i don't think there has been a fair hearing uh for the acquisition other than tonight and i certainly believe that covid uh, presents a great impediment uh, while um, i look at it just from a personal perspective if uh, i get people coming to my door today uh, frankly, I do not go to the door to, to answer the door. Uh, I, I don't think that that's uh, an unusual position for the time and to have opposition against an organization that is so well organized, well funded and having uh, uh, sort of uh, been able to canvas the neighborhoods on multiple times uh, does not have a fair playing field or uh, an informed public, so. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hunt. Um, two things, and and I did listen to that, um, the, the council meeting, 
um, and and Mr. Beloga's comments on there um, were were well founded and 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 yes, even though tonight there were and that was a very late evening meeting um, and the comments were made that the the hearing could continue knowing that we were having a charter commission. So yes, so there are more residents able to speak. Um, in that regard, but we're still not in the setting where everybody is feeling that they aren't able to make the voice known. The other point I wanted to make in the, the language that was part of the, the the ballot or the proposed language was a comment in the staff report that um, the ballot question could be placed and then the following 12 months there could be education. And my 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 other comment on that would be that's the presumptive already then that that is is or is not approved that versus tra educating the people and the voters now um, as to what ranked choice voting really is and and having some more meaningful discussions versus putting it and saying okay we're going ahead with this and now we'll now you can learn about it so not ending entering into um, you know contracts or agreements or anything without being well informed that's basically what we're asking the citizens of Bloomington to do thank you um, Chris. thank you mr. chair just as the author or the co-author of that staff memo if I could clarify the intended message a little bit there would be uh, staff uh, would foresee two levels of education one would be if the uh, collective wisdom of the Charter Commission and the Council were to put it on the ballot, then the city has a responsibility to provide factual information about it. We cannot advocate for or against the adoption of a ballot question, but we can put out factual information. That would take place from the time that it was decided it was going on the ballot until election day. And then pending the outcome on election day, if it were in fact adopted by the voters, we would have 12 months until the municipal general election in November of 2021 to help voters by saying, this is what's going to be done and here's how you um, complete a ballot in a ranked choice ballot situation. So there are two phases of education. Um, and, um, in that first phase, the city um, is very, very factual and allows both advocates and opponents to make the more the vote yes or the vote no argument for any ballot question, whether it be this ballot question or some other topic. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, Commissioner Stanley. Commissioner Stanley, you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm less concerned. Uh, I appreciate Chris. I appreciate your comments about explaining two different phases of education. Uh, but it seems to me that that second phase of education is is uh, somewhat entirely secondary to an electorate going to the polls to vote on something that they do or do not understand. And so I'm much more concerned about the time leading up to the vote, if that's the way, if that's where we would end up, that that period of time is adequate under our current circumstances uh, and priorities. That the period from now until this November is far more important with respect to the educational process and that what happens the following year well, if, if they voted for something, if something has passed that they didn't understand, the voters didn't really understand it, it passed anyways, and then we're going to spend a year educating them how to do I'm not worried about teaching them how to mark a ballot. I'm more worried about them understanding whether they should vote for, whether we should vote for or against something uh, that we don't fully understand. And again, uh, I and I appreciate uh, Council Member Bloga's uh, clarification on the vote that you took. Uh, we don't always even even in, in the commission, we struggle sometimes uh, tonight's another example of uh, we struggle sometimes understanding what it is we're supposed to be voting on and what it really means. Uh, so, um, uh, council member Bloga, I, I appreciate you explaining your vote and that seven to nothing vote. Um, so, uh, again, I just, I just think uh, it's not a priority for the city shouldn't be a priority for the city. Uh, and we don't have adequate time for the voters to uh, to 
to uh, learn what this is all about. Thanks. Thank you. Um, are we ready to uh, to vote on the? We have a motion and a second on the floor. Motion by Barnes, second by Peterson. Are we ready to do that vote? Any other comments? Commissioner Beloga, I see your hand. I was just getting ready to unmute, knowing that I'm one of the first uh, to vote. Oh, there you go. Commissioner, you, Commissioner did you have your hand up? I think uh, Commissioner uh, Weatherby does. Yes. Uh, who had their hand up? Weatherby. Commissioner, we Commissioner Weatherby, thank you. I just wanted to make one quick comment, and everybody's saying, during this time, it's not a good time to put this to the voters. I actually think it's a good time to put it in front of the voters because they have more time to actually study it because there's not as much going on right now. And so they'll have time to be able to get on their computer, which I have done in the last few weeks, because you have more time to sit and study these things than in your normal life when you're running from one thing to another. So that's just, that's just my thought about having this on the ballot now. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hunt. I, I would uh, respectfully disagree. And that's just my perspective with dealing with business owners and so forth and just the time and the energy and how do we make payroll? How do I hire employees back? How do I do this? How do we do a childcare? How do we deal with staffing? So, so many other issues facing citizens that um, um, are, are just overwhelming for people that um, adding something else, I don't think is the appropriate time, but. Commissioner Axtell. Well, just one comment in closing, based upon the emails that I've received uh, from the, uh, the the group that is advocating us, very well organized, uh, uh, very articulate, is that uh, my concern is making sure that both sides have got adequate time to uh, to get out and present their case in front of uh, our voters. And I just don't think it's there right now. And I just uh, want to make sure that uh, we've got a fair playing field. Thank you. Commissioner Stanley. Okay. We ready for the vote? Motion. We have a motion on the floor by Barnes, second by Peterson. Could we have the roll call vote, please? Thank you, Chair. And if you wouldn't mind when you give your vote, please say clearly yes or no. Axtell. No. Beloga. No. Barnes. Yes. Goodermont. No. Hunt. No. Nelson. Yes. Steve Peterson. Yes. Stanley. No. Nelson. Yes. Weatherby. Yes. Looks like we have a tie here. And that would mean the motion does not pass. It requires a majority. Do we have anybody who would like to make any amended motion? Any other discussion on this item? Mr. Chair, I move to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? A second that. Was, was that Hunt? Thank you. We have, a, we have a motion and a second to adjourn. Again, another roll call vote. Thank you, Chair. Axtell? Aye. Loga? Aye. Barnes? Aye. Goodermont? Aye. Hunt? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Stanley? No. <laughs> Thorson? Aye. Weatherby? Aye. Motion passes nine to one to adjourn the meeting. <laughs> Commissioner Stanley, you are welcome to stay. <laughs> no, thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you all for your time and interest uh, on this. Thank you. Chair? Big thank you to everyone. Chair? Yes. 
Um, I'm sorry, I was tabulating votes um, when listening. Uh, and I know that we've just adjourned, um, but I just wanted to let this group know that uh, I will be conveying the message um, to the city council um, at its, um, in the one weekly, um, which is this Friday and um, letting them know uh, and, um, and then providing some information about uh, possible next steps at this point. Um, there hasn't been any action by the by the charter commission, there hasn't been an approval or a rejection. There hasn't been any action. So Correct. I think that we will be meeting again. Um, so Denise will be looking for you to provide your availability. All right, thank you for that. Um, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Beloga. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the comments were from the city attorney. But it seems as if the city attorney is saying that uh, there's a presumption that uh, council is going to uh, ask for a second hearing on this item by uh, the charter commission. Is that what I interpreted? Uh, Chair, would it be? I believe it might be appropriate to reopen the meeting um, to because I have some information that I need to convey. Okay, the, the, the adjournment happened very quickly, and I think it would be helpful to reopen it so that I can explain okay. what state. And my apologies for that. Um, my bad. Okay, so um, I will now uh, call to order, uh, to, uh, recall to order the meeting of the Bloomington Charter Commission. And I don't believe that requires any kind of vote. So. Uh, um, Denise, are you following along here? Yes, are we calling this a second call to order? Uh, yeah, um, yes, uh, I guess this is a second call to order. Mr. Chair, if it would be more of an eloquent solution, I would withdraw the motion. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, do, does that work from a technical legal standpoint to withdraw the motion that we already voted on? Uh, Chair and members, we've already, um, are you, uh, Councilmember Beloga, are you talking about the motion to adjourn? Yes. That, that motion's already been voted on, so I don't know that you can pull that motion back. I think what I would prefer is a motion to reopen the meeting. And I just, I, may, I, I just reopened the meeting. Do we need a motion? I, I think given the fact that this body has selected to adjourn the meeting, okay. I, I would prefer a motion to reopen. Then we can cover all the bases. That's that's a good point. Okay, Mo looking for a so motion to reopen the meeting. So I'm moved. To reopen the meeting. Second. Second. Uh, who is our motion? Original. Who made the original motion? Weatherby. Weatherby. And then who made the second? I didn't. No, Nelson. Nelson. Okay. Motion by Weatherby's. Second by Nelson. Again, a roll call vote. Quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Still. Hi. Beloga. Aye. Barnes. Ronald, if you could unmute. Aye. Thank you. Goodermont. Somebody Aye. keeps muting me. Hunt. Hunt, if you could unmute, please. Aye. Thank you. Nelson. Aye. Peterson. He's muted. Hi. Thank you. Stanley? Aye. Chair Thorson? Aye. And Weatherby? Aye. Thank you. Uh, Chair members, by me. Before you begin, Melissa, can I ask commissioners to please mute? Thank you. Chair members, the the particular procedural posture that we're in in this um, in in the process that was started by the city council back in uh, May and sent for your consideration tonight, uh, the choices that by state law you have before you is to approve the proposed amendment amendment or reject or substitute um, provide a, a substitute amendment. So I I see that you've taken action. Um, uh, there was a motion to approve the, uh, 
resolution that did not pass. It did not get a majority. Uh, and I can report that to the council um, that there was no action at the city at this uh, charter commission this evening. Um, however, that leaves the question open as to does this body want to provide a substitute amendment or does this body want to reject the uh, resolution that it was bef that's before it? At this point, it hasn't uh, taken any action um, of the three actions that are available under state law. So I believe that the, the body may need to get back together um, or it may just um, not uh, review it. Um, the state law provides 60 days for the Charter Commission to review the proposed ordinance um, and then it can extend it for an additional 90 days. So we're within that first 60 day period now. And so if there isn't any action taken within those first 60 days and um, there is or is not an, an effort to extend it for an additional review period, um, then I would report to the, to the city council that um, that period expired before the charter commission took any action. Commissioner Hunt. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would uh, make a motion to reject the ordinance as placed before us. To be to reject the resolution. Uh, Correct. Commissioner Hunt. And I would second it. Uh, all right, motion by Hunt, second by Axtell. Uh, any discussion on this item? Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I see three hands, so I'll get to everyone. Commissioner Stanley, I saw yours first. Um, I need clarification. How is this motion? Does it differ in substance from what we just did up then being reversed? Chair and members, if I may, um, what the, the matter, the action that was just voted on uh, previously, which was a motion to approve, nothing happened. There, there wasn't an approval of, of the motion. So it, the motion failed. There was, that doesn't mean that the resolution that was also before you rejecting it then passes. There would need to be a subsequent standalone action to reject the uh, because that resolution was also provided in your packet. And that's what this is. That's the motion that's on the table currently. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, one, uh, one question I have for the city of Harvey team is whether it's whether it's possible for us to approve this, but to set it, set it for a date other than the general election that's coming up, is that not possible? Chair, I didn't understand. I didn't hear that question very clearly. It was jarbled. Okay, let me give it another shot here. It looks like it's a little- I can hear you better now. Okay. Um, so my question is, um, you know, listening to the conversation and listening to some of the objections, they seem to be primarily around timing. And so my question is whether um, we are able to um, either adopt the council's proposal, but but adopt it in a form that um, is that would be on the, the ballot in two years at the statewide general election, or if we can decline their proposal and make a counter proposal to that effect, if that's within the power that we have. Uh, chair. And if you if, if you don't if you can't answer that tonight you can say I can't answer that tonight and we need to report back. Uh, if the chair recognizes me, I'm happy. I can certainly answer that tonight. Yes. Uh, chair and members, yes. um, I believe that you could offer up a substitute amendment uh, under your powers and in, in, in state law, and you could change the effective. You could you could put that language in your resolution. Um, you could direct me to draft something and offer that as a substitute amendment back to the city council to say 
um, that you would like them to put you would like to them you would like them to amend their um, ordinance and change it instead of being on the 2020 state election. Um, you want you want it to be in the 2022 state general election or the 2021 or whichever year you want. Um, I believe that that would be within your power under state law to offer up that substitute amendment or in the alternative to direct me to bring that back to you uh, to for your consideration. Uh, Commissioner Nelson, I saw your hand. Thank you. So, uh, just procedurally, let me let me ask this question um, uh, for council. Maybe um, if if we didn't approve the motion, if we if we didn't pass the motion, and now if we don't pass this motion, doesn't that lead to a report back to the city council saying the charter commission didn't act, uh, and the city council can then consider other pathways? to accomplish what is clearly the city council's wish on this uh, uh, ranked choice voting. This is just one mechanism available to the city council, as I understand it, for accomplishing this result. And there are other mechanisms or pathways for the council to do it if we don't, as a charter commission, accept this pathway or reject this pathway. Uh, chair, chair, uh, chair and members that that is true. Um, if both the approval and the rejection um, do not pass this evening, I would provide that report uh, to the city council and then that 60 day period would continue to toll um, that 60 day period that's provided for charter commission review um, by state law. Then the city council would be able to. Uh, move forward with the other way that it can amend the charter. Um, there are the other ways, um, one of which is, for example, a unanimous vote of the city council to amend the charter. Right, so correct. So so it's it strikes me that it might be likely that we're that we will have another five five vote. So if we had another five five vote, you would be able to report that to the council and the council would be able to deliberate and come up with its next judgment on how to proceed. That is, Chair and members, that it's a possibility that that's what the City Council would do. Mm, thank you. Here, it looks like uh, Commissioner Barnes. I was muted. I was. Do I have the floor? You do. Oh, thank you. Uh, isn't it uh, isn't it true that another option that the council has is to simply proceed to put it on the ballot? I guess I'm addressing that to Melissa. Melissa, uh, Chair and members, I would have to look into that further. I. Uh, that's not a question that I've researched prior to this meeting. Um, I would say that the chart, you know, based on the plain text of the state law that I'm looking at right now, that 60 day clock would continue to run um, and the commission could ex potentially ask for an additional 90 days um, by filing a resolution with the city clerk for that additional time. And so during that time um, that the charter commission has to take action um, and review, I, I don't believe that off the top of my head without doing additional research that the city council could um, could could, can, could act um, without the involvement of the charter commission. Uh, I'll follow up uh, to that. Is it uh, e even if uh, one of these? Uh, well, say the say the rejected motion passes, uh, the city council could still uh, proceed with putting it on on the ballot. Could they not? Melissa? I believe that's unclear. Didn't you say that, Melissa? Uh, Chair and members, if the Charter Commission rejects the proposed amendment, um, the, the resolution that's here tonight um, before you, if you all reject that, I would report that back to the City Council. Um, the one other time that I've had this happen, um, well, something similar to this happen, what I proposed in that instance was for there to be a uh, concurrent meeting of the city council and the charter commission 
in that this this type of a document, this type of a change is is uh, is so substantial um, when you're changing the charter that it's important to have both bodies involved in that process. In that this is the constitution of the of the city, and it's important that all 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 bodies or all members of those bodies are involved in such a significant change. And so I would recommend a concurrent meeting of the two bodies in an effort to try and either get on the same page or to abandon the current effort. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Nelson. Um, that that strikes me as a very healthy way to approach it. Um, uh, I clearly we're split and we're split with a with an incomplete membership of the charter commission uh if there's a future meeting uh with other members of the charter commission who are able to attend instead of unable to attend that might be a fuller discussion and if it's a joint meeting of the council and the commission that too would be an opportunity for a a full uh discussion that's a very healthy approach i i appreciate that Commissioner Weatherby. Uh, just one quick comment. Um, how do we have a 5 5 vote when there's 11 of us? Didn't everybody did everybody vote? I count 10 commissioners. There are 10 of us 10 commissioners present. 10 commissioners. No, there's 11. Who's the 11th? Well, Hunt, Loga, Thorson. Stanley, Lewis, Goodermont, Axtell. Janet Lewis is the Peterson um, Weatherby. Commissioner Counted. Weatherby, uh, Janet Lewis is our city clerk. She's a member of our city staff. She's not oh, a I'm member sorry. of I the she commission. Was, okay, I thought she was on the board. Okay, that, that answers that. Uh, any other, com uh, Commissioner Beloga? Uh, point of uh, clarification from the city attorney. Uh, the vote is 5-5 and the rules of procedure of the Charter Commission uh, do not specifically address tie votes, but it says that uh, it will use uh, Robert's Rules of Order. And I believe that Robert's Rules of Order uh, state that uh, a tie vote is a vote that uh, goes against. So I would uh, conclude as a result that the Charter Commission has spoken to reject that, and that is the information that is obligated to be forwarded to the City Council. Uh Chair Thorson here, um, Melissa, in terms of our bylaws, is that correct? Uh, Chair and members, the bylaws are silent on tie votes. Uh, the Actually not the bylaws, it's technically the rules of procedure of the Bloomington Charter Commission. Uh, the rules of procedure um, discuss uh, that the quorum is eight members and the, um, and we have 10 people present. There are 15 total members. Uh, there is no specific rule in your rules or procedure about a minimum vote requirement for adoption of resolutions and ordinances. Um, and in the absence of a specific vote requirement, uh, then it's a simple, the general rules that it's a simple majority. Um, on a tie vote, um, there was a tie vote, so there was no majority. In that instance, in that that was a motion to approve the resolution in the packet. Uh, so there was no majority achieved on uh, that tie vote. So I imagine to to sort of uh, proceed with what our what state law indicates our options are. We do have a motion on a table to um, deny the. <clears throat> The motion or deny the um, item. Uh, we also have a a, dis uh, uh, a point of discussion regarding uh, a possible uh, approval uh, to a date in the future. Uh, 
uh, if anyone else would like to speak uh, in particular right now about that uh, uh, option of, of uh, approval and, and uh, at a future date, just so we can get that one. Uh, Commissioner Beloga. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I did not hear uh, the attorney address Robert's Rules of Order. Chair, I believe uh, prevail. Chair and members, I'm reading from Roberts, um, and it says if a motion requires a majority vote, it fails when there is a tie vote. Okay. All right. So the mo that we we've already concluded then by this new information that the that the uh, motion failed or that was it automatically denied because it didn't get a majority. Is that correct? Uh, Commissioner Peterson. Mr. Chair, I respectfully disagree with this interpretation because uh, if you read the statute, the statute allows us three options. We can accept um, changes from the council. We can re we can affirmatively vote to reject them, or we can create alternatives and send them back. And the proposed interpretation of Robert's rule of order here means that if the first vote on something caused it to fail, you could never create another option. Okay, um, and so I, I believe that the commission has to have a majority to select one of those three options. Um, and if if no motion has enough um, votes to pass, then effectively what ends up happening is the clock runs out, and that's how the that's how we exit this process. But I do I do not believe that um, a failure of the motion to approve it is equivalent to a the success of a motion to reject it because there's other options. Taking. I agree with that. Uh, Commissioner Nelson, I see your hand. Um, maybe I don't need to say anything in light of the, the uh, council's agreement. That, that sounds like the right approach. But just to sort of follow up on Commissioner Peterson's remark, there are only three options. Each option requires a majority. So that is what it is. That there, there was a motion to approve that didn't get a majority. If there's a motion to reject, which we're now considering and doesn't doesn't get a majority, that doesn't it doesn't pass. That's the stage for then a healthier uh, and fuller discussion, as the council has suggested, as alternative pathways. There's no reason right now to stop this whole thing, and there's no you know that that goes back to the question of whether or not to to prevent the voters from having a chance to decide. It. There's no reason to stop this because the discussion can be fuller with a fuller commission available and with a fuller opportunity to discuss this with the council and the commission combined. Thank you, Commissioner Nelson. Anyone else? Uh, Commissioner Stanley. Uh, so that I better understand a few of these options in front of us, uh, Commissioner Nelson, um, if, if if we reach a, another five to five tie on the vote to reject the council's whatever, uh, there's no guarantee that the council is going to agree to or to have a joint meeting with us. Is there? And I'll uh, accept anybody's time. Feel free to chime in. I don't know that. How can we count on council wanting to join me with us if we neither accept uh, or approve or reject if we end up on another five five tie? Oh, Commissioner, that's a, it's a good question. I'm I'm not saying there's a way to guarantee it, but what I'm saying is that 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 another five five vote leaves open the opportunity for the council and the commission to get together. I don't I don't see a way to guarantee that. I think one way perhaps to move forward, I don't want to interrupt you. So if you want to have more to add, but I think one way to move forward and know where we are at right now in the is to, is to vote on the second motion to um, deny the amended. We have an agreement on that. Uh, again, a question to, to, for clarification. Uh, Mr. Yes, Chair. Commissioner Stanley. If we vote in this particular case, rather than 5-5, five, five, let's say 6-4 for the motion to reject Council proposal, then that's a more clear statement of where we're at, or that that's not fair, uh, Commissioner Peterson. I don't think you'd accept that as fair. Um, 
if we reject it, it goes back to council to do then decide to do something and they're free to do whatever they want. Is that clear? Is that, is that correct? And one of the reasons I'm suggesting that rather than talk about what happens if we vote one way or the other is we just do the vote now and see where that puts us and then discuss what the options might be. Well, I'm trying to get a better feel for how I should vote. <laughs> it's kind of stall, huh? Any, any other comments? Uh, Mr. Chair, I got one more comment, Commissioner Peterson. Commissioner Peterson. Um, given the um, the unusual way in which the meeting apparently ended and then didn't, um, I'm strongly opposed to us taking any action that's dispositive at this point in the meeting. Um, to be honest, I think the only uh, correct action for us to do at this point is for the authors of the motion that's currently on the floor to withdraw it and for us to adjourn and have another meeting. Any, for, any discussion of this item? Um, would the would the person who made the motion uh, be willing to withdraw that motion? Who made the motion? Commissioner Thorson, that was me, Hunt. Hey, Commissioner Peterson, could you restate that comment again, please? So, so you know, we, had, we had some confusion because we have led members of the public to have left the meeting because we we affirmatively voted and the result was announced that the meeting was adjourned. Um, and to be honest, I, I question whether we're really in a position to take any action at this point because of kind of the irregular nature of what, how we reconvene the meeting. Um, and so in order to be fair to the public, I think at this point we should withdraw the motion that's on the floor and we should simply adjourn and set a, a date for another meeting. And, and point is, that's, I think the point is, is well taken. Um, thinking about the people who may have been hanging on there in that regard. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I'm normally, I'm normally somebody who, as much as anybody wants to kind of get stuff done, but I don't want to uh, do it in the form of something that feels rammed through to some people because that's just wrong. Good point. Um, do we have a way of... Commissioner? How do we know? Do we have a way of tracking who is still on the phone or not on the phone? And I see Commissioner Axel waving his hand too. He's so small down there in his office. <laughs> 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 um, okay, so do you have anything more to add, Commissioner Hunt? Did you just have the question? Do we have any way of knowing? Uh, Chris, is there any way of knowing um, who was on? And I, I might add, does it matter? I think Steve's it point is well taken. What's the other question? Yeah. Mr. I mean, Chair? It does matter. That's my point is, yes. Mr. Chair, it would be up to the city attorney to opine as to whether or not you are in sort of a valid session in which to take a motion. But I can tell you that at the time you adjourned the meeting, I believe you had approximately 23 or 24 yeah. callers or attendees on the line. You were yeah. down to 19 when Commissioner Hunt asked the question and it just popped up to 20 people while I have been trying to answer your question, I see phone numbers, partial phone numbers. I do not see who is here and who is not. So that's the information I can provide. Commissioner Axtell, I'll take you and then Commissioner Stanley. The, um, and I agree with uh, Commissioner Peterson is that if we lost people because of this, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it probably wasn't an in, in, inappropriate adjournment. But I do have a question for the attorney, city attorney, in terms of the, if we reject this, is that, aren't we in the same boat anyway? And then it goes back to council and the council okay. has to make a decision as to what they want to do next. Uh, chair uh, and members, if you, the action that you took um, or the motion that did not pass related to uh, requesting approval of the resolution would re would be reported to the council. Um, there was no action taken on that on that motion. Um, nothing nothing passed. Um, and so, if you took action to reject the resolution, um, that would also be reported. Um, if it's another tie vote, um, I would report that it didn't pass. It didn't fail. So yeah, I mean, you're still at the same place you were before. With regard to the irregularity of the 
um, you know, potential irregularity of the adjournment and then the reopening and the note, the noted um, change in listening listenership. Um, I would say that that it's ir that it is um, somewhat of a cause for concern on my part, um, given that we know that some people dropped off and um, and may not be hearing this. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily um, no longer, uh, you know, a potentially lawful meeting. It's just that we know that we lost people. We know that people are interested in this. Um, so. I, I have yet to find uh, language in the rules or procedure about um, uh, a, a 30 second later uh, reopening of an adjourned meeting, um, but I'll continue to look, but it's certainly um, somewhat unusual. My apologies for not catching that. I was busy uh, researching um, another matter while you all were rolling through there and, and then I realized what happened. And so I, I, I apologize for not catching that sooner. Um. Commissioner Hunt, did you have your hand up again? So it seems to me that the, the cleanest option uh, in terms of being as transparent as we can, even though it's um, left somewhat vague, is to follow the recommend, recommendation of Commissioner Peterson and withdraw that motion and either choose to send the item to the city council with no act or report to the city council that no action was taken or to um i guess continue this or schedule another meeting uh with a full hopefully of uh, more attendees and uh, deal with this item again commissioner stanley i'm um Again, puzzled over the language, uh, City Attorney Manishai, um The legal expression you're using, "no action taken," uh, is does not um, uh, is not the same thing in my mind to saying that a vote was taken on the motion to accept and it did not pass. Now, maybe I'm splitting a fine hair there, or maybe you're entirely within your Bounds to say no action was taken. Uh, chair, uh, chair, uh, chair. Uh, yeah, uh, Commissioner Stanley, you raise a good point. Um, I, I would report that there was a motion to approve, and that motion did not pass. It it failed on a tie vote. I will. I, that's that what would I would my, technically report. That would be my preference and and my request. It would be the most accurate. Thank you. Yes, that's that's what I would have reported. Okay. Now, was that your hand? <laughs> Commissioner Extel. No, I'm okay. Okay. All right. Um, Commissioner Hunt, uh, are you open to withdrawing your motion, given the current discussion? <laughs> I. Uh... I'm really not. Okay. And um, I will uh, call the vote on this item. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Beloga. Uh, could we have the uh, motion read again, please? Commissioner Hunt. The motion was to reject the ordinance as proposed. I second, I believe the second was Axtell. Commissioner Axtell. All right. Motion by Hunt, second by Axtell. We'll do a roll call vote. Denise. Could, Thank could you. you restate that again? I didn't quite understand what I'm voting on here. Chair, we're essentially vote we're essentially voting on the opposite of the first motion. This is a motion to deny. The proposed ordinance. Hunt, as a point of clarification, um, are you seeking to make a motion to adopt resolution 2020 dash blank that rejecting the proposed amendment to the city charter as set forth in the ordinance and the, the resolution that's in the packet? Commissioner Matt, or city, Ms. Ms. Vanderside, I'm having some difficulty with the background noise. Could you repeat that? 
Um, Commissioner uh, Hunt, I'm seeking clarification on the motion that you made. Are you seeking to make the motion that's in the packet to adopt resolution 2020-blank um, re that is rejecting the proposed amendment to the city charter? That would be correct. Provided in the packet? That would be correct. And the, does the seconder, uh, Commissioner Axtell, is that your understanding of the motion as well? All right, we'll now call the roll. Uh, call the vote. Thank you. Axtell? Aye. Beloga? Aye. Barnes? No. Goodermont? Aye. Hunt? Aye. Nelson? Sorry, Tom, you're muted. Oh, oh you muted yourself. Oh, no, sorry, no. <laughs> no. Thank you. <laughs> Peterson? I'm voting no. Stanley? Stanley, you're muted. Yes. Um, Chair Thorson? No. And Weatherby? No. Again, we have a 5 5 vote. So, Chair, um, my report to the city council would be that there were these there were two motions made and uh, a motion to approve and a motion to reject and uh, neither of those motions passed they both uh, failed for failure to reach a majority because it was a 5-5 tie vote uh, on both items um, that would be my summary of the meeting this evening that i will pass along to the city council um, and um, and then uh, I guess we'll see what they do. All right. So um, uh, I'll get right to you, Commissioner Barnes. When we have had some uh, recommendation and and some discussion requesting a joint meeting with the city council. Um, I don't know if this requires a motion, but to make everybody's uh, uh, intent clear, do we have enough interest in that as a potential solution to this? Um, uh, where we're at now, or do we wish to leave it as is? Any comments or thoughts on that? Commissioner Beloga. Um, I, uh, I believe that the uh, council uh, provided uh, this to this matter to the Charter Commission uh, for consideration, and that uh, to me it uh, seems to be overreaching uh, to have a joint meeting where uh, there can be uh, lobbying by uh, council members. And it's uh, somewhat obvious to me that the weight of the council uh, is being judged to be very important in this matter. So I think that may be uh, an, uh, an that would be a move that I would not recommend. I would say that we need to act uh, on our own and under our own authorities. Very good points. Uh, any other comments? Uh, Commissioner Barnes and Commissioner Peterson. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, if uh, Commissioner Peterson would uh, care to put her, his previous idea into a motion, I would second it. I'm not sure I could articulate it. My understanding is that uh, you would approve the um, uh, the council's resolution, uh, but modify it to uh, uh, for putting on the ballot in 2022. Uh, Commissioner Peterson, I saw you ha I had your hand up, and then Stanley, I believe, I saw a hand too. Commissioner Peterson. Um, I think given given the late hour, um, my 
preference would be at this point for us to set another meeting. Any other comments, Commissioner Nelson? I think that's the right idea as well. I don't. I don't. I don't think we're prepared to uh, uh, develop a substitute or, or alternative motion. Um, I also think that we're obviously not in a position to uh, call a joint meeting or require a joint meeting, but I, I am uh, very comfortable with the notion that if the council wants to have a joint meeting, I for one would surely attend, so. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Stanley. I would echo the sentiment to have another meeting and um, uh, ask Commissioner Peterson if he cares to draft a, a proper language along the lines of what he's heard tonight or what he senses tonight. Uh, and that is uh, that we're not opposed to putting it on the ballot, but that we'd like to have a little more time. At least that was my reading of, of Commissioner Peterson's uh, uh, comments earlier. Uh, I just, uh, I certainly lean that way and would uh, like to have a, a, a another meeting rather than try to do anything tonight. Commissioner Axtell, I see you have your hand up. Commissioner Axtell, I believe you're muted. Yeah, this is just my opinion, but I prefer that the Council focus their time on the issues on hand uh, to solve this budget deficit, and I would be uh, opposed to another meeting right now uh, unless it is a, truly a public forum and not a Zoom meeting like this where you can get people to turn out and uh, testify in the way they should. Commissioner Hunt. Commissioner Hunt, I believe you're muted. There I go. I would be um, in agreement with Commissioner Axtell that um, a future date in a true public forum might be in order, but now is not the time. And uh, again, reiterating the council focus on um, more essential items than this at this time. Commissioner Nelson. Well, I think that's that's fine. I, you know, the I have two thoughts on that. One is it's not for us to say. So if the council wants to have a joint meeting or wants to ask us to uh, uh, do something else, the council is perfectly prepared to do that. I'd also say, you know, that, that this timing question is not something that I think we should overdo. The federal courts are all proceeding with the hearings. The state courts, mm -hmm. the Supreme Courts are all going through hearings and rendering judgments on matters that matter so that the fact that we're on zoom is not uh, uh it should not be viewed as an obstacle to trying to get to the right result and i don't think that we need to uh, uh take that path if, if we have something that we want to handle we can handle it with these zoom or whatever the platform is uh, approaches just like the other important members of our government are doing right now, including the courts. Thank you. But Commissioner yeah. Peterson, then Commissioner Below. Uh, Commissioner Hunt, you have a follow up? Just a, a reiteration that while we might be able to be it on Zoom, we have the public that has a dip, more difficult time um, connecting and, and, and perhaps conveying their thoughts. Peterson. Being sensitive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I just I want to um, support what Commissioner Beloga said earlier is that I think this group needs to exercise its independent judgment about this. And um, uh, I, you know, if you if you go read the statute, the choices we are we have we can either uh, accept it by a motion, we can reject it by a motion, or we can create some sort of alternative and send it back to the council. And I think this group should focus on using its independent judgment and making one of those three decisions. Um, with that, what I want to do then is that we move to uh, ask the staff to pull the commission about setting a date for another meeting. And that's motion? That's a motion, yes. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Barnes, motion by Peterson, second by Barnes. And this is just to uh, hold another meeting to continue our business and finish our business 
Um, I would now ask for a roll call vote on this item. Thank you. Axtel? Uh, no. Beloga? No. Yes. Goodermont? No. Hunt? No. Nelson? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Yes. Stanley? Yes. Commissioner Stanley? Yes. Um, Chair Thorson? Yes. And Weatherby? Yes. All right, in this case, the motion passes, correct? So uh, I would ask staff to um, poll members, all members, on an appropriate date that uh, we're setting a follow-up meeting to continue our business on this item. And with that, uh, look for another motion of to adjourn, unless there are any further comments. Moved. Second. Motion is second. We'll have a roll call vote. Sorry, I was diligently typing. Who made the motion and second to that, please? Stanley. Stanley. Second. Weatherby. Weatherby, I thought so. Thank you. Axtell? Hi. Beloga? Aye. Goodermont? Aye. Hunt? Aye. 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 Stanley? Aye. Chair Thorson? Aye. Weatherby? Aye. Motion passes, meeting adjourned. Thank you everyone for your patience on this unusual um, meeting. It's an important topic though, and I appreciate everybody's uh, participation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night all. Thank you. Good night everyone.